becomes the one that actually shares oh, your this ideologies. This has been a party political broadcast uh, on behalf no, of I the don't. Reform UK party. Hi, I'm Ofcom. Just, I'm just... Kids think all they have to do is take pictures of everything. Just shut down TikTok. Problem solved. This is really unfair. What's, what, what's unfair? If it's on camera, we're not doing the interview. Yes, I'm going to do. I'm you're, going going to, you're going to resign? Yes, because I cannot continue my work. When I say I am God, I'm not joking. Did you feel Elvis was controlling? I've been answering your question, you answer mine. It's actually not my job to ask. On TV, on radio, and on your smartphone, this is Talk TV. This is Talk Today with David Ball. A very good morning to you. It is six o'clock on Friday, the 5th of January. You're with Talk Today on TV, on radio, online, and of course, on your smart speaker. Our top stories this morning. A war of words. The Prime Minister hints at an election later in the year as Starmer accuses Sunak of squatting in number 10. Bombshell claims former US President Bill Clinton is named again in the latest court releases of the Epstein files. And Sunderland say sorry. The football club's owner says he is disgusted after a bar at their stadium was redecorated with their arch rivals' Newcastle slogans. And after yet another deluge, we now have over 300 flood warnings in force. The outlook, thankfully, is much drier, but it will turn colder. Isabel, thank you very much indeed. Not more flooding, honestly. I've been flooded once already. I can't cope with any more. Well, a very good morning to you. Lots of stories this morning, particularly day three of the doctor's strikes. The rhetoric ramps up. The war of words increases. Victoria Atkins, the health secretary, actually says the NHS belongs to all of us, not just to you, to the British Medical Association, to the junior doctors. Rob Lawrenson himself, uh, this is the junior doctor's co-chairman says the NHS hates doctors. We'll be talking about all of those stories, also about the latest uh, political goings-on. Has uh, politics become too venomous? Well, I'll be joined by Rosie Wright in just a moment, but first of all, it's time for the headlines with Emily. Good morning. A major incident's been declared in Nottinghamshire, where more than 100 homes have been flooded. Hundreds of warnings are still in place across England and Wales after Storm Hank brought heavy rainfall. Great Western and South Western Railways are warning of severe travel disruption. A drone boat belonging to Houthi rebels has detonated in the Red Sea. The US Navy says no damage or casualties have been reported since the blast. Meanwhile, the uh, Foreign Secretary, David Cameron, says attacks on cargo vessels in Red Sea shipping lanes have to stop or international action will be taken. Over 10 countries have signed a statement saying to the Houthis, these attacks are unacceptable, they're illegal and they've got to stop. And if they don't stop, action will be taken. A student's been shot dead at a high school in the U.S. state of Iowa on the first day back after the holidays. A 17-year-old, who was also a pupil there, fired on six people before taking his own life. Officials say four of the five injured were students, one of them's critically ill. The former Paralympian Oscar Pistorius is due to be freed from a South African prison later, 11 years after murdering his girlfriend. The amputee runner, the first to compete in the Olympics in 2012, shot Reva Steenkamp through a bathroom door, saying he mistook her for a burglar. And the first range of stamps dedicated entirely to a female pop group is being launched, marking the 30th anniversary of the Spice Girls. They feature their performances over 15 years, from Jerry Halliwell's Union Jack mini dress in 1997 to the closing ceremony of the London Olympics in 2012. Those are headlines. I'll have another update in half an hour. Can you believe that was 30 years ago? It seems extraordinary. I know. They were my favourite group. Were they? Years, so Which one I, were you? I was Baby Spice, obviously. Well, obviously. I, I need to get my hands on these stamps. Uh, well, uh, yes, I think uh, I think we should all do that. I mean, I can't quite believe it's 30 years ago. It seems like yesterday to me. I know someone who probably was a Spice Girl. Isabel, were you a Spice Girl? And if so, well, which one? Oh, for goodness sake. Ginger Spice, I mean, goodness <laughs> sake. Yeah, um, but on a serious note, the weather is a big, big story, isn't it? I mean, it you've experienced... 
the amount of wet weather, the sodden ground. We've had such a lot of rain in the last few weeks. Yes, absolutely. And I have to say that being a victim of flooding is no fun at all. And I feel so sorry for those people caught up in it. Yeah, me too. And then what's so nice is bringing you better weather. And, um, you know, that's all we need is a massive area of high pressure. It's just what the doctor ordered, David. Quite right. Um, yeah, high pressure building in, which really will settle things down. So let's take a look. Times Radio sponsors Talk TV Weather. Well, we saw another 30 to 40 millimetres of rain across the south and east last night. Some awful conditions. That low is now pulling away. We'll still keep some rain across more northeast and central areas from that weak front, but then high pressure will build in, drying things up at long last. A chilly wind setting in across the south, but otherwise where you have the clearer skies to the north and west, there'll be more frost around, there will be some freezing fog as well. So definitely a change in what we'll be talking about over the next few days. So out there today, well, there's that low, still raining actually across parts of East Anglia and Lincolnshire. And this frontal system trailing down from eastern Scotland through central areas will give some quite persistent rain at times, particularly near the east coast of uh, Aberdeenshire. There will be showers coming in across the northwest of Scotland, but the rest of mainland Scotland, mostly bright with some sunshine, not too bad a day for Northern Ireland. Some showers filtering down through Wales in the southwest, but sunshine in between those showers, whereas further east, it'll be more cloudy. It does start to turn drier, but uh, not particularly pleasant out there. Still some dampness around. And temperatures will be a notch down on yesterday's around six to nine degrees. Now, this is the zone, I think, where we'll keep the clouds through this evening and tonight, just from the, say, the southeast of Scotland and northeast England, down through the Midlands into central southern England. Not a lot of rain on that, but some to the west, some long, clear spells developing, showers tending to fade, and I think there will be a touch of frost across some western areas tonight. You might even find a little bit of mist and fog by morning as well. But for more eastern areas where you hold on to the cloud, temperatures holding up near a four or five degrees. And then on Saturday, well, this is the zone where we'll keep more cloud, a little bit of rain, but it'll tend to tail off. Otherwise, best of the sunshine in the west with much fewer showers as well so not too bad a day in fact for Scotland improved as well for the east coast where we've had quite a lot of uh, rain in recent days so a nice day for Scotland chilly but bright Northern Ireland faring well Wales and more western parts of England also seeing sunshine so a pretty decent day out there and as you can see the more central and eastern areas still holding on to cloud but the next few days and nights remember it does turn colder for all Times Radio sponsors Talk TV Weather. Thank you very much indeed, Isabel. Our top story today, Rishi Sunak has suggested an election will take place in the latter half of the year while speaking in Nottinghamshire. My working assumption is we'll have a general election in the second half of this year. And in the meantime, I've got lots that I want to get on with. Uh, this Saturday, we'll be introducing a significant tax cut for millions of people in work, worth on average £450 for an average worker. Because we've halved inflation, we want to keep managing the economy well and cutting people's taxes. And I want to keep tackling illegal migration. Interesting wording, wasn't it? Working assumption. I'm it glad you picked that, up on that, yeah. It suggests that he's not really the one in control, but he is, isn't he? That announcement somewhat scuppered the Labour leader Sir Keir Starmer's <laughs> speech, where he, in Bristol, accused Sunak of squatting in Downing Street for months on end. Well, joining us now is the Sun's deputy political editor, Ryan Saby. Ryan is with us. Ryan, good morning. Good morning. A bit of a problem there. So Keir Starmer's ready to set out his stall, tell everyone his ideas, and, oh, Rishi Sunak has finally given a bit more of a steer about when the election will come. Um, did it completely overshadow Keir Starmer? It did slightly, because everyone's interested in when the country's going to go to the polls and when everyone's going to have their, their democratic rights uh, to, to see who's going to form uh, the next government. But I think... Rishi Sunak, he had to say something on this because he didn't want to get into a situation like Gordon Brown in uh, 2007 when Gordon Brown was about to call an election but then bottled it um, at the very, very last minute and got labelled with the, um, you know, with Botsler Brown. And I think Rishi Sunak just had to signal somewhere along the line in the first few weeks of January that the general election wasn't going to be held in the next few months because the pressure would just build. You can just imagine the situation in February or March this year when he ums and ahs, he doesn't, he decides not to have an election in May. Labour would be all over it. And I think he just had a signal somewhere along the line that that election was going to be in the latter part of the year.
I mean, uh, I think Rose is absolutely right. He's given himself this room for manoeuvre. The working assumption is that it will be in the latter part of the year. Many people were saying it was going to be time with the local elections. Let's move on to Keir Starmer. What did you make of his speech? He talked about Project Hope. He talked about the downtrodden UK. He talked um, about a decade of national renewal. Did it set your world on fire? Um, uh, not massively. I think there's a lot of language, but I think Labour, um, late senior people close to Keir Starmer, were sort of trying to make the point this this speech wasn't going to be heavy on policy. It was just going to set out sort of the broad themes. The, the trouble is when you are trying to be the next prime minister, you can't always talk about broad themes. And I think the public at some point will expect sort of detailed policy. Now, we're going to get that as we come closer to the election, but I think if you're trying to take the, the keys to number 10, that they, there needs to be a little bit of detail. So you can talk about hope and partnerships that are built to last and ending the sticking plasters of politics. And it's not all about divisive politics anymore with, with, with Keir Starmer. But at some point, you just need to step up to the mark and uh, you know give some, give some detailed policies. I mean, Keir Starmer's argument, though, and what he was saying yesterday is move from despair into hope was not about specifics. He's saying if you're feeling frustrated, if you're feeling like you haven't been represented properly, uh, then come to us. So his strategy seems to be that right now, the specifics, that they really can wait because we're going to play on sort of heartstrings. And I think when you're 20 points ahead, you're absolutely right. And I think when you're 20 points ahead in the poll, um, sometimes you don't have to deal um, um, in, in specifics. You can be you can be extremely broad. One thing that may get Keir Starmer into, into number 10, the fact he's not conservative and he's not Rishi Sunak. And people have just found after 13, 14 years that they, they want to they want a change of government. And that is something that Keir Starmer is is tapping into that the trouble is the closer you get to that general election is that when you really really will come under 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 greater scrutiny so you can take for example the 28 billion pound um green green jobs plan he set that stall out two years ago 2021 at the labor party conference and now it's coming under real scrutiny mm -hmm. So now it's not going to be implemented in full until possibly the end of uh, end of the next parliament, and then only if it meets their their fiscal rules. So, you know, if, if they are coming out with big policies, that, uh, that they are going to get scrutinised very very closely. I mean, th this is very much a, a change in tone from him because I sort of mentioned or intimated about the lack of charisma there. But maybe the public are saying, we don't want someone who's charismatic. We want a safe pair of hands going forward. For me, there was something else very interesting about what he said, which is all about the economy. Labour would never have majored on that to say the economy is something that's really important to us. The economy is safe under Labour's hands. Did you pick up on that as well? Yeah. Keir Starmer made it extremely clear during during that speech yesterday that if the Conservatives want to fight the election on on the economy, as, as Keir Starmer said, bring it on. The trouble with the Conservatives, they can you know, everyone may think of them as tax cutting Conservatives and a tax cutting party, but the trouble is the tax burden is the highest it has been for seventy years. So it's very difficult for Keir Starmer, uh, for Rishi Sunak. Jeremy Hunt to go to the country and say they are tax cutting conservatives in general. Now they're trying to do something about that. This Saturday, the uh, national insurance cut will come into will come into place, so people will feel they may feel a bit, um, a bit with a bit more money in their pocket. But again, the thresholds have not changed at all. Um, so those tax thresholds, when you start paying tax, when you move into a bigger tax band, have stayed the same. So as you earn more money, you pay more. You are paying more tax on that, and people generally aren't maybe not feeling much better. And Labour have come out and said this is a, a Tory tax con. And they say that families are £1,200 worse off as a result of the national insurance uh, coming down because those thresholds have, uh, have stayed the same and more people are paying tax as they move into those higher thresholds. Yeah, Jonathan Ashworth is going to be with us just before 8 o'clock, I think, making exactly uh, that argument, uh, Ryan. Should we move from the economy to health? Because the Victoria Atkins, the health secretary, we've been obviously, as the junior doctors in England have been on strike, we've been talking about it on the programme. She's said to the BMA in particular, basically, you don't own the NHS, we all own the NHS. And she's almost sort of said that the BMA 
are sort of holding them to ransom because in these situations, the mechanism that they've got, they've put in place that when hospitals say, we're at a critical situation, we need those doctors to come off the picket line, the BMA have said no in some of those cases. What we're seeing is sort of a, a, a toughening down from the government, particularly to say, we will not budge. Do you think the health secretary has got the public mood right to say, we're not on side with the strikers? I think in general terms that the, the public are on, on, on the side of uh, the, the junior doctors. The, the trouble is they're asking for a pay rise that is, that is far too big. And it's just, I think, on both sides, Labour and Conservatives, are just not going to stump up that 35%. It, it's, it, it's just not going to happen. So I, I think the, the, the trouble is when you get into the situation, where, as you say, where you have hospital doctors saying, look, there's big, big problems. There's critical incidents in the in these hospitals. We really need the junior doctors who are standing outside the hospitals on the picket lines to come back to work. And they're saying, and the junior doctors and the and the, the leadership teams that are around them are saying this is just being done for for political reasons. So you're in a there's sympathy for the junior doctors because everyone, lots of people are saying over the last 15, 20 years, their their pay, pay has just not gone up in line with with with, with other sectors, but. You've got this really sort of emotive language from Victoria Atkins, the health secretary here, saying you can't just switch the, the health service on and off. You know, if they're being called in because there's a critical incident, they, they have to be there. And if they're turning that down, you can see the junior doctors losing some sympathy as well. And, and Ryan, you're right. There were over 20 of these so-called derogations yesterday where the junior doctors refused to cover those hospitals. At the same time, they've been offered 8% plus another 3%. That's 11%. How do you think this ends? This is very much a standoff. When you've got Victoria Atkins saying the NHS does not belong to you, junior doctors, but at the same time, you've got people like Rob Lawrenson who is saying the NHS hates junior doctors, which, quite frankly, isn't true. Yeah, I, I think this, this, the, these strikes will possibly go on for, for, uh, for months and months. And it just seems that are the, are the, are the juniors, do, junior doctors waiting for um, a, a Labour government to, to come into power to actually resolve this? We've seen that uh, on the other side, you've got the as left the train drivers union. They're also saying they'll work, they'll strike up until the next election. You just wonder whether they're, they're playing politics every time that the junior doctors go on strike. It means more and more I mean, hospital appointments and consultations either cancelled or postponed and put off. So you just wonder whether the, the, some of them are just trying to put the Conservatives in an even worse light. And uh, don't forget that Rishi Sunak, at the beginning of last year, he was saying that he wanted to bring down those NHS waiting lists as one of his five pledges. Every time that these junior doctors walk out, they just make, make that mm. task harder mm. and harder for him. Yeah, they stack up. Ryan, thank you so much. Really appreciate your time. Lots to come here on Talk Today. Palace insiders believe Prince Andrew will never return to the fold after the release of the Epstein files. And legendary Mary Poppins actress Glynis Johns has passed away at the age of 100. Author Nikki Hodgson and Spike Fraser Myers are here to take us through this morning's papers. Do stay with us. The time is 6.17. Thanks for joining us. You're with Talk TV on TV, on radio, online. We're on your smart speaker as well. Criminals using XL bully dogs as weapons to threaten others. No matter how well trained, most dog owners will tell you a dog can turn. Do you know what I love about Talk Today? We do it all. Sunak, Suella, scones. I rather like David Cameron. I don't sort of bear him any ill will because he delivered the referendum that he said he would deliver. The Tories love a scrap. You can almost see this coming round the tracks with Suella Braverman. She's heading up one side and Rishi soon at the other. The police are pro-Palestine. That is just not right. You swear an oath in the police to act without fear or favour. The Covid inquiry seems to have turned into a sort of pantomime. There's not really any substance to it. It's hard to know whether it's a farce or a tragedy. For the amount of time it's taken, the number of illegal migrants currently sent by us to Rwanda, zilch. The amount of money it's cost, we're saying, what are we saying it's cost? About 140 million. 140 million pounds so far. So 140 million pounds so far result nil, absolutely nil. Are we only going to be trusting sources like Meta and Google? Where is our unbiased news going to come from? Calais in winter is cold. <laughs> that is from the Jeremy Corbyn book. 
Kevin O'Sullivan is the worst presenter on talk TV. Sitting on his fat ass, <laughs> talking for a living. If you're walking towards me and you're a vegan, you should have a great big orange sticker over here saying, watch out, vegans about. The weirdest plank that we've had in, what, yeah. three years? Hundreds and hundreds of mice in a box, which he walks into a branch of McDonald's. McMouse Man. McMouse Man, yeah. McMouse Man. He should be easy enough to catch this guy, shouldn't he? I mean, he's got a house full of mice. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> This is a major summit. President Biden decided this was important after watching a Tom Cruise film. Sunak and the current Conservative government are not conservative. Why don't you leave that party and come to one that actually shares oh, your ideology? This has been a party political broadcast uh, on behalf no, of I the don't. Reform UK party. Hi, I'm just, I'm just... Kids think all they have to do is take pictures of everything. Just shut down TikTok. Problem solved. This is really unfair. What's, what, what's unfair? If it's on camera, we're not doing the interview. Yes, I'm going to do. I'm I'm going to, you're going to resign? Yes, because I cannot continue my work. When I say I am God, I'm not joking. Did you feel Elvis was controlling? I've been answering your question, you answer mine. It's actually not my job to answer your questions. Are What's you prepared you? to call is Hamas possible, a have, terror group? Is it possible to have a rational you discussion can't, can with you? you? I've asked you two questions. Should Hamas stay in power and are they a terror group? You're refusing to answer either of them. They that won't. is very telling. Talk TV. It's the only place where you get the truth. You've done a book on poetry. Poetry and music for the many. I love poetry. We can agree on that. Welcome back to Talk Today. The time is 6.20. We'll have the papers for you in just a moment, but here is what else is coming up in the programme. Now, as more documents relating to the disgraced financier Jeffrey Epstein are released, we'll bring you the latest analysis just after half past six. More VAR controversy as Everton boss Sean Dyche admits it's testing his patience. It's following a contested red card at Crystal Palace. We'll have all the latest sport just before seven. And it is the, the first, definitely not the final, <laughs> the first Friday of dry January. A real test for those taking part. So at quarter to eight, we're going to go inside a so-called dry bar to find out about some alcohol-free alternatives to get you through the month. But first of all, let's take a look at some of this morning's front pages. Let's start with the Times. We were just talking about this story. It's leading with the Health Secretary's message to striking doctors, who she says have said the NHS, her message to them, belongs to all of us, not just you. Uh, moving on, no way back, says the Mail, as the paper claims Prince Andrew will never return to the royal fold after the release of the Epstein files. And in the sun, time to give Andrew the chop as pressure mounts on King Charles to punish his brother after more lurid allegations. Well, author and journalist Nikki Hodgson and Spike Stepty editor Fraser Myers are here with us for a look through this morning's papers. A very good morning to both of you. Good Happy morning. New Year Happy as well. Year. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, very nice to see you, actually. <laughs> um, should we start with you, Nikki? Let's start with that story, the front page of the Daily Mail. This is no way back. Yeah, so this is claiming that the uh, release of these Epstein files are, me are meaning that... Um, King Charles will have to banish Prince Andrew permanently from royal life. And um, as we know, there's not actually particularly anything new revealed in these documents. It's going over old ground, things that we've heard in Virginia's, uh, Virginia Gaffrey's uh, accounts of what happened between her and the prince, um, and things we've heard through uh, Ghislaine Maxwell's trial. So it's not that anything new is particularly in these and more damning. It's that they've, you know, resurfaced. They've reminded the public that actually... Prince Andrew is accused, like I always say, he's always denied the charges, he's accused of these, these acts with um, young girls, and as a result of that, he just isn't suited to being in the royal family. And we should stress that every time these allegations come up, he vehemently yes. denies all of them. Fraser, do you think that is, you know, in, in terms of the royal family's perspective, the public's view of him is that, you know, a re-emergence into public life or a public role is just impossible? Yeah, I mean, you know, Prince Andrew has the popularity of, say, Hitler or something at this point. I mean, he's so disgraced, um, even though, as you say, he, he denies the, the claims. Um, and what's interesting is that, you know, people remember that Newsnight interview. Mm. That was his attempt to clear his name. And the man is so deluded that he thought it went really well. He apparently told the Queen that he did an excellent job. Mm. And uh, he's uh, convinced the public to back him. It's fair to say he's learned from that. Uh, I would hope so. Well, maybe not. I mean, there was talk that he was going to do a countersuit to Virginia Giuffre and yeah. again clear his name. 
Uh, I think, uh, you know, maybe a bit of silence would probably be sensible, and certainly from the, for the rest of the royal perspective. And, of course, very tricky this for the yeah. king as well, because, actually, at the end of the day, it's his brother, and he has really? he's made a real effort, actually, to bring him back into the fold, hasn't he? We saw him with the family at Christmas. Absolutely. And this is what I actually think about this story. I think about the family. I think particularly about his daughters, who've done absolutely nothing wrong, and their lives must be so difficult because of what he's been accused of mm -hmm. and the way this has been conducted. And at the end of the day, whatever you think about the royals, they are a real family. Maybe they don't have relationships the way we have them, but there's got to be some love and some care and some sorrow there for what's gone on. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. We're going to be uh, hearing from royal correspondents across the, the day and the morning here on Talk Today to kind of tease through the other revelations that really have come out from these papers. But right now, should we move on to the front page of The Times, Fraser? Victoria Atkins, the health secretary, has basically said to the BMA, um, you can't switch the NHS off. This is because David was mentioning earlier. There are these situations where um, there's, there's basically a system in place where mm. if hospitals get to a capacity or a point where they say, actually, patient safety is at risk, we need mm. to call docs off the picket line. Uh, in several cases, the BMA have said, no, we're not doing it. And the health secretary says, that doesn't stand. Yeah, it is quite extraordinary. I mean, you know, there are some critical services where you think that, um, you know, some, sometimes there have to be exceptions to strikes. I understand the importance of the right to strike, of course. But, you know, the NHS, this is a particularly busy week for the NHS or a particularly busy period of time for the NHS. And, um, you know, there needs to be some cover given by, by junior doctors. So, so for me, this is derogation. Mm. So what happens is, even though you can strike, if the trust is under immense pressure, and we've seen that with all these black alerts, they say, we are desperately in need of your help. Now, over 20 requests were submitted, and the junior doctors, quite frankly, said no. We also have Rob Lawrenson saying the NHS hates junior doctors. This has now become very deeply political. Mm, yes, very much so. I mean, I suppose from the perspective of some junior doctors, what they're thinking is, we've seen what's happened to our predecessors, we've seen how tough their working life has been. We want to go in with a better deal from the start, with the hope that we're going to be treated better throughout our careers. I, I presume that's what some of, their, some of their views are. But I agree with you that if it's about, you know, basically risking life, I mean, you know, mm -hmm. it's really, really is about risking life at this point, and you're being asked repeatedly to help because of that, You've got to really go against the Hippocratic Oath, so, so haven't you, the other to, bit that, to take that? You know, I just want to feed into this. The junior doctors won't even do elective uh, cancer therapy. Yeah. Now, that speaks volumes to me, or elective maternity care, because I, I just wonder whether they are losing the respect of the public. They've already been given 8% plus 3%, 11%. They're asking for 35%. Do you think they've overplayed their hand? I, I think so. I think the 35% claim will strike most people as really quite shocking. Um, but, I, you know, every Everyone deserves um, uh, inflation, at least pay rise, and maybe a bit more, I think. I think that's totally reasonable. Um, I, I, anyone would, could support that. But, yeah, 35... Because they're saying that they want earnings to go back to the way they were in, you know, 2008, yeah. to have the same purchasing power. And, again, you can kind of understand that argument, but no government is going to give them 35%. Labour I mean, is, is not going to... We'd all like a 35% so... pay rise. And, and I think there's one other thing here, which is that when, when people are asked, do you support junior doctors, they think of very young doctors. Mm. Junior doctors is a misnomer because yeah. it covers everyone from when you qualify all the yeah. way up to consultancy. So yeah. we're talking about sort of 30-odd thousand up to 70,000 in terms of pay scales. Yeah, yeah I, th I think that's the other thing. That one of the other missteps of their campaign is that they've tried to say that we're just like workers at Pret or something like that. Yeah. And it's like, well, it, you're not. This is a middle-class profession. There are really good opportunities for going up the pay scale. And the career progression and is something exactly, that's yeah. important to... Yeah. yeah. This is going to go and on and security. on. job security. Who will be dealing with the <laughs> NHS and uh, strike action? <laughs> we now, <laughs> finally... I think it's sort of been a flirtation from Rishi Sunak to say, OK, I'll give you a time frame, but nothing more specific. <laughs> so, Nikki, front page uh, of the mirror. Um, Chicken Sunak, though, says the Labour Party. <laughs> the Labour Party. Um, they yeah. say, saying no election at this spring. <laughs> and also, they're going to... They, They've used this word, and I think we're going to hear this again and again when we hear from the Labour Party. They're saying, Rishi Sunak, you are squatting in number 10. <laughs> well, I do think it's quite a bit of clever rhetoric on, uh, on the Labour Party's part there, because obviously we know what uh, Conservatives think about renting and, and this, the plight of housing and all the rest of it. But I think, actually, this story is a bit, again, kind of overblown, because think about it from the Conservatives' perspective. You know, Keir Starmer's going on about what is he hiding. He's hiding nothing. We know what's going mm -hmm. on. Yeah. You know, they've got about, what, 20%? 24% of the yeah, vote women, Labour have got 40, yeah. and then other parties have got about 10, you know, creeping up, uh, you know, Richard Tice, 
uh, giving that speech this week as leader of reform seemed very kind of like in his power, very persuasive. I can imagine lots of people that have fallen out with the Tories thinking, mm. yeah, he seems mm. like a good option. The thing is for Sunak, timing is everything with this. And mm. I get, I guess what he's hoping is that in the few months left, but not too many months for things to go really wrong, he can get some gains under his belt. So maybe some stop the boat stuff. Yeah. Uh, maybe that tax uh, break is going to kind of set in and people are going to feel a bit, bit better off. But timing is everything. If something happens, if we have a national catastrophe, like, mm. you know, praying that we don't, mm. but if something random happens, this could really just ruin everything for him. But at the, point, at the minute, they won't win. So all he's got to do is just kind of stay, say, that's all he can do. Mm. And, and I suppose in many ways that was the right thing for him to do, which was to keep it open as yeah. long as he possibly yeah. can without tying himself down. Actually, if you look at what he said, it was incredibly nebulous. That's true. But he also, he has said something. He's given some indication so he can't just be charged with bottling it yeah. when, the, when the election inevitably doesn't happen in May. I mean, <laughs> fa uh, famously, Gordon Brown was accused of bottling it and, you know, that sort of hung, out, hung around him like a millstone for a mm. very long time. Yeah. Mm. Um, but, you know, it's, yeah, it's obvious Rishi Sunak is, is waiting it out, hoping something will turn up. He doesn't necessarily have any ideas to make things turn around. That well, much is clear. Yeah. Does Starmer have ideas? Because we have a, <laughs> the thing is, as journalists, we really yeah. want to pick at the policy. Yeah. Mm. But does that really matter? For the public, they can just say, do you know, I'm fed up. It's time yeah. to give the yeah. other side another go. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Starmer is probably, no, has even less ideas than <laughs> Sunak. Or he has other people's ideas, you could say. You know, he, he will say one thing and, and do another, um, sometimes within the space of about six months. Uh, it, it's, it's shocking, really. I mean, he's so empty that you, you just wonder that something will have to fill the void. They will have to have policies eventually. But they do have, but what one, will it be? They do have one really good, I think, proposal, which is to do with renewable energy and making that kind of nationalising uh, renewable energy, yep. uh, led by Ed Mil Miliband. I think with young people, that would be very popular because it will be seen as something progressive, working towards, uh, you know, sorting the climate problem out. And it does sound new. To me, that sounds new. That sounds different. Mm. But that is pretty much does all sound, he's got Does it sound minute. inspirational? I don't know. I like it. I, okay. I, would, I would vote for that. So. Um, let's move on, if we can, to the Daily Telegraph. This is the front page of the Daily Telegraph. I just feel so sorry for these people. Residents being rescued, evacuations as floods hit hard. I was talking to Isabel about this. More, more flooding, more yeah, flooding. This is absolutely dreadful. People in Tewkesbury completely cut off from the, from the rest of the world. Um, you know, these, these floods at the moment are terrible. And it feels as if we haven't quite... Um, we, see, we seem unprepared for flooding all the time, even though it is a strikingly regular occurrence. You know, this is not a new phenomenon. Um, and yet we don't have the flood defences we need. We know this is going to carry on. I think, you know, one thing that worries me is that we are a little bit obsessed with, um, you know, we talk a lot about climate change. We're talking about the 100-year picture, but we're never thinking about, well, what can we do? What actions can we take now to prevent um, disasters, to mitigate disasters? Instead, we're thinking almost way too long-term, if that makes sense. Yeah, I was yeah. going to say, particularly in my part of the world, I've already been flooded once, and it is the most awful feeling, mm. and you can't do anything about it. Uh, people taking sandbags out, for example. I wonder, though, whether we are actually looking after the countryside. Are we dredging the ditches? Are we actually making sure we don't build on floodplains? All those things contribute. The water has to go somewhere. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think it's interesting that a few years ago, you know, we used to have access to an EU fund that gave us money to help with flooding. We don't have that anymore. So part of it's to do with the lack of uh, investment in, uh, you know, supporting people to kind of keep their homes safe. Mm. But yeah, we've, we've just got... I totally agree with Fraser. It's just bonkers. This is happening now and we don't know how to deal with it. But we're thinking about, yeah, what we're going to do after fossil fuels, so... Mm. Nikki, Fraser, thank you both so much. They'll be back with us uh, in just under an hour to go through more stories inside the paper. So don't go anywhere. Yes, indeed. Now, it, though, it is time for a quick news update with Emily Rose Adams. Good morning. Almost 300 flood warnings are still in place across England and Wales with a major incident declared in Nottinghamshire. Hundreds of people there have been evacuated from their homes after Storm Hank brought heavy rain. And rail passengers in the southwest are being warned not to travel today if possible. A student's been shot dead and another five injured at a high school in the U.S. state of Iowa. A 17-year-old, who was also a pupil there, fired on them before taking his own life on the first day back after the holidays. Mitch Mortvert is, the public safe, is from the Public Safety Department. The shooter has been identified as 17-year-old Dylan Butler, a student at Perry High School. Butler was armed with a pump-action shotgun and a small-caliber handgun. Butler also made a number of social media posts in and around the time of the shooting. 
law enforcement is working to secure those pieces of evidence. And the British actress who played Mrs. Banks in the 1964 film Mary Poppins has died aged 100. Glynis Johns died yesterday in an assisted living home in Los Angeles from what her manager described as natural causes. You're up to date. I'll have more headlines at 7 o'clock. Oh, thank you very much indeed, Emily. What a brilliant film that was, Mary Poppins. Iconic. Yeah, absolutely iconic. Did you like it? Of course, of course. I saw it on stage, actually. We Did you? Saw, which was much more kind of a modern interpretation of it, but they had no. a very creative way of doing that. No, it was good. Genuinely recommend okay. it. Very good, very good. Now, you've been getting in touch uh, with some of your own stories as well. We're talking about the doctor's strikes uh, this morning. The front page of The Times, doctors told the NHS belongs to all of us, not just you. This is very much the rhetoric ramping up. This is between Victoria Atkins, the health secretary, also the junior doctors themselves. Rob Lawrenson, I have to say my mouth fell open when I read what he said, which is the NHS hates doctors. Now, Emma has messaged in saying, my gran was a nurse in the early 1950s. Her generation would never strike. She always did what was best for her patients in the country. The younger generation in medicine is spoiled and selfish. Tough words. Robbie, though, uh, doesn't agree with Emma. I'm in full support of the doctor's strike. They should go on an indefinite walkout until this corrupt government brings forward an offer that's worthy of consideration. Uh, they're not going to do that. Victoria Atkins says, uh, mm. look, within 20 minutes of you stopping striking, we'll start talks. But the BMA say the strikes are here to stay. So, you know, there we go. I mean, also, Deadlock. it depends who you talk to. So doctors of my age, we did much longer hours. For example, we got paid less money. I'm not saying that that's not a reason to strike, and I think the junior doctors should get more. But surely they could get round a table because at the end of the day, the people who are suffering are the patients. Only, says the health secretary, if you stop the strikes, there lies the problem. Uh, let us know what you think. You can text talk and your message to 87222. Right now, though, we've just been talking about flooding. Mm. Isabel is here with the weather. Uh, for many, it's pretty miserable. Oh, it's just awful. We had another 40-odd millimetres of rain in the last 12 hours or so. The worst of it, actually, from yesterday's wet weather was Hampshire. And... Uh, Luckily, Nottinghamshire, not really too bad with the recent rain, but obviously, once it gets into the catchments, it takes a... It, it responds quite slow, uh, responding catchments really across the Midlands. So there's still going to be uh, a rise in the flood warnings. We've got over 300 now, so we'll keep an eye on that for you. But the good news is that the outlook weather-wise is much, much drier. Times Radio sponsors Talk TV Weather. It really has been a wet few weeks, though. We've had eight named storms. And yesterday, of course, that really nasty low that gave such a deluge. That's moving away. We've just got the remnants of this frontal system here that will bring some cloud and patchy rain to some central and eastern areas over the next day or two. But then as high pressure builds in, that tends to peter out. And for many, it's a quieter spell. Colder as well, nighttime frost and some fog, and a chilly wind with an easterly across southern parts of the country. You'll really notice that later this weekend. Out there today, though, well, there's that low in the southern North Sea with the rain coming in still to East Anglia and Lincolnshire. This frontal system here, well, it's just offshore, actually, from Aberdeenshire now, but it could well come in and pep the rain up for Aberdeen, also spinning into the borders of northeast England. West of that, though, it's a brighter, more showery picture, a few heavy showers, but some sunshine in between, and the same goes for parts of Wales in the southwest. A few lively showers, but sunny spells too, whereas further east, it'll probably stay rather cloudy for much of East Anglia in the southeast, but at least the rain will fade. And temperatures just a notch down on yesterday, seven for Aberdeen, nine in the south, and then through this evening and tonight, we've got lengthening clear spells in the west, which means the temperatures will tumble. Could be some mist and fog as the winds ease. We've still got this zone of cloud, though, stretching in from the northeast of England all the way down into the Midlands and central southern England. And here, temperatures will stay well above freezing, but there'll still be a millimetre or two of rain, potentially. Out to the west, that's where you'll have the lowest temperatures. And then tomorrow, more sunshine on the cars, thankfully. Still, though, some cloud across more central areas. Times Radio sponsors Talk TV Weather. Thanks, Isabel. Now, another batch of documents related to disgraced financier Jeffrey Epstein have been released, amounting to an extra 300 pages of material. Yesterday, Prince Andrew and Bill Clinton were among high profile figures named in the US court papers. Let's find out more. Newsweek's chief royal correspondent, Jack Royston, is here. Jack, good morning. 
Good morning. When it comes to Prince Andrew, I think that the challenge with this is we, we haven't actually learned anything really new, have we? No, not at all. And in all honesty, I wasn't hugely surprised about that because we have had uh, his accusers uh, give uh, you know give interviews to Netflix. We've had huge numbers of court documents previously. This whole thing has been kicking around since uh, since well before 2016, really. And of course, uh, Virginia Jeffrey sued Prince Andrew herself, so we had all of the findings from that court case. Um, but what it does show Andrew again and reinforce is that this just isn't going to go away. And of course, the uh, anti-monarchy campaign group Republic has now reported him to the police. So we'll have to see whether they decide to look at this again. Um, I think that really it's King Charles III who should be watching most closely because the message should be loud and clear to him that were he ever to be seen as allowing Andrew back into the fold, or to restart a career in the public eye, it would go down very, very badly with the public. We can see how much interest there still is in this scandal. And there's a real feeling, I think, among the public that there is something not yet done, you know, that there is a prosecution that could or should have been brought that was never done. Um, and that means that there really is absolutely no way back for Andrew. And it's interesting, I mentioned this earlier on, the fact is that at the end of the day, of course, they're brothers, and the king has, has really reached out with open arms. This may well change that. In terms of this, all of these documents were released uh, due to the judge, Loretta Presca. Yeah. These are the first of many pages that will come, high-profile individuals that are being named. Now, that doesn't mean any of them have done anything wrong, but clearly this story is ongoing. Yes, absolutely. And I think the real uh, key thing to try to look out for when new documents come up is actually, uh, I think it's unlikely there'll be completely new allegations against names we've never heard before. But what there might be is little bits of detail here and there that challenge or undermine or disprove some of the things that some of these public figures have said. So, you know, for example, we Andrew is on record saying why he went to visit Epstein in um, in 2010 um, at the at the tail end of 2010, and he says it was to break up the friendship in person because he was too honourable to do it over the phone. So, if there was some staff member who had given a, a, a slightly different account of that or something in that sort of ballpark, that would be very interesting to see. But I mean, what we've got, we've got to remember is that the women who have taken part in these court cases, many of them have been interviewed by Netflix. Um, so we do, broadly speaking, know what they have to say already. Mm. Uh, for Prince Andrew, he just had a, a, a mini attempt at rehabilitation in terms of the public Christmas, view over yeah. Christmas. Mm. How is he going to respond to this? Is it just going to be silence from the palace, do you think? It's going to be silence from the palace, but, I mean, you really have to ask questions about why he was allowed to do that walk over, like, walk about over Christmas, talking to them in the public, shaking hands, you know, people go down to Sandringham with their kids... Uh, is, you know, is it appropriate for him to be doing these kind of things? Christmas is one of those classic examples of a situation that is ostensibly a private family celebration of Christmas. It's a private family trip to church. And this is, you know, it's not just what the royals have always done. It's what Prince Andrew has always done, go to Sandringham. Um, but needless to say, it is also walking onto a public stage because the media are invited by the palace press office to cover the walk to Christmas as a media event. You know, the public are welcomed into Sandringham to to kind of you know look out for the royal family. So uh, it's not straightforwardly purely a private event. You know, uh, press offices who are paid for with um, partly with public money are there uh, stage managing a PR moments for the royal family, and Prince Andrew was invited to be part of that. Um, and they knew these documents were coming out. You know, we all knew they were going to come. So they knew it was going to be back in back in the papers, back on the TV uh, in January. And let, yet they let him do it anyway. And Charles should be very careful about this. And, and just in terms of the family, of course, the, I think the king has has been very open with his brother, allowing him back in. We've seen this reintegration into the family, as you rightly say, with the Daily Mail, the front page, saying no way back. I mean, clearly there are mm. other members of the royal family who take a very different view, who are telling the king, you need to break ties with Andrew. If you remember, he was going to kick him out of his house. He then reneged yeah. on that because he was his brother. Yeah, absolutely. Look, I think um, it's highly likely that uh, William, you know, takes a slightly tougher line on this than Charles. Um, although Charles, you know, Charles was trying to kind of marginalise the uh, Andrew's side of the family um, way back in the 90s before this whole Epstein thing ever blew up. So, you know, he does have it in him 
to take tough decisions and to be, you know, arguably ruthless when he wants to be. Um, but seemingly, interestingly, since the Queen passed away, it does seem that that kind of slightly protective instinct that the Queen felt has passed on to Charles. Perhaps he feels that he has his mother's wishes to respect. Um, I think, though, that they have to see in a really clear-eyed way that there are issues for the actual monarchy here going forward that they need to keep in their mind too. Could, could this be the worst it gets for Prince Andrew? I mean, if he doesn't go to the US, it's unlikely that he'll face legal questioning. We're hearing that reported this morning. Republic can, as much as they ask, ask the Met Police to issue some kind of criminal investigation, but the Met have previously declined to do that. And nothing significantly new has come out to maybe, you know, restart that process. So could he sit back and just wait for this to blow over? Because as we've said, there's no sort of new zinger that we can also get our teeth into. We know the same facts than we did before these papers came out. Yeah, look, even if you went to America, the FBI in America have never launched a prosecution against an associate or client, Jeffrey Epstein. The prosecutions have all been, well, it's been Epstein himself and Ghislaine Maxwell. And uh, they may well continue to look at other people who were within Epstein's inner circle and inner sanctum and worked for him. But there are people out in America of all of these allegations against them who have never been you know, interviewed by the FBI. So I think it's very unlikely we're going to see Andrew prosecuted either in Britain or in America, um, despite the fact that there were efforts in previous years to, uh, by the FBI to get an account of his experiences from Andrew. But they did make it clear at the time that they wanted to interview him as a witness, not a perpetrator. Yeah. Now, why the FBI have chosen not to go to the men who were on this client's list uh, I don't know. You know, it's. It, it, I think we could do have an explanation for that in the interests of kind of transparency and open justice. But Andrew's. I, I think it's exceptionally unlikely that Andrew is going to be criminally pros prosecuted because if it, if there was a basis for criminally prosecuting Andrew, then what Would about you know all the other names? yeah yeah all the other names on that list. Um, Jack, so thank yes, you so he... much. We've got so much to tease through with the other names that have been. Uh... You know, yeah. come out in the last 24 hours. So, Jack, really appreciate your time. Yes, uh, thank you thank very you. much indeed. Still to come, Jake Robson is here with all your sport. Thanks, David. It was Crystal Palace versus Everton last night in the FA Cup. But why does Sean Dyche feel that his patience is being tested? Plus, find out why Sunderland had to issue a grovelling apology to fans ahead of their clash with Newcastle this weekend. And the Luke Littler effect, as the World Darts final became Sky Sports' most watched non-football event ever. That's all coming up. This is Talk Today. Good morning. We're here. Thanks for joining us. You're with Talk TV on TV, on radio, online. We're on your smart speaker as well. Criminals using XL bully dogs as weapons to threaten others. No matter how well trained, most dog owners will tell you a dog can turn. Do you know what I love about sport today? We do it all. Sunak, Suella, scones. I rather like David Cameron. I don't sort of bear him any ill will because he delivered the referendum that he said he would deliver. The Tories love a scrap. You can almost see this coming round the tracks with Suella Braverman. She's heading up one side and Rishi Sunak the other. The police are pro-Palestine. That is just not right. You swear an oath in the police to act without fear or favour. The Covid inquiry seems to have turned into a sort of pantomime. There's not really any substance to it. It's hard to know whether it's a farce or a tragedy. For the amount of time it's taken, the number of illegal migrants currently sent by us to Rwanda, zilch. The amount of money it's cost, we're saying, what are we saying it's cost? About 140 million. 140 million pounds so far. So 140 million pounds, so far result, nil, absolutely nil. Are we only going to be trusting sources like Meta and Google? Where is our unbiased news going to come from? Calais in winter is cold. <laughs> <laughs> that is from the Jeremy Corbyn book. Kevin O'Sullivan is the worst presenter on talk TV. Sitting on his fat ass, <laughs> talking for a living. If you're walking towards me and you're a vegan, you have a great big orange sticker over here saying, watch out, vegans about. The weirdest plank that we've had in, what, yeah. three years? Hundreds and hundreds of mice in a box, which he walks into a branch of McDonald's. McMouse Man. McMouse Man, yeah. McMouse Man. He should be easy enough to catch this guy, shouldn't he? I mean, he's got a house full of mice. He's on <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> This is a major summit. President Biden decided this was important after watching a Tom Cruise film. 
Sunak and the current Conservative government are not conservative. Why don't you leave that party and come to one that actually shares uh, your ideologies? This has been a party political broadcast uh, on behalf no, of I the don't. Reform UK party. Hi, I'm Ofcom. Just, just... Kids think all they have to do is take pictures of everything. Just shut down TikTok. Problem solved. This is really unfair. What's, what, what's unfair? If it's on camera, we're not doing the interview. So. Yes, I'm going to do. I'm you're, going to, you're going to resign? Yes, because I cannot continue my work. When I say I am God, I'm not joking. Did you feel Elvis was controlling? I've been answering your question, you answer mine. It's actually not my job to answer your questions. Just Are you prepared you. to call is Hamas a have, terror group? Is it possible to have a rational you can't, discussion can you? with you? I've asked you two questions. Should Hamas stay in power and are they a terror group? You're refusing to answer either of them. They that won't. is very telling. Talk TV. It's the only place where you get the truth. You've done a book on poetry. Poetry and music for the many. I love poetry. We can agree on that. Welcome back. The time is 6.49. Now, Crystal Palace hosted Everton for the third round of the FA Cup last night. And whilst the game was goalless, Everton manager Sean Dyche admitted his patience was being tested by VAR after Dominic Calvert-Lewin was harshly sent off. Well, the sports journalist Jake Robson is with us to take a look through at the day's sporting news. OK, rightly ticked off at VAR or not? Oh, goodness me, where do we start? Probably, <laughs> probably not. It's just one of those things, isn't it? Everyone has their own opinion. It was, it was one of those ones where they've looked at it back and over and over and over again. VAR is supposed to provide clarity. There you go. It? Slow it down enough and then you're going to so get... So, just picture. talk us through what happened exactly and why they went to VAR. Yeah, yeah. so Dominic Calvert-Lewin, he slid in on uh, Nathaniel Klein. They're playing in the FA Cup last night. He slid in. He's brushed his leg, the Klein's leg, mi minuscule amounts we're talking. Right. Uh, his foot's up, his studs are up, and it's just scraped his leg. I don't think they've seen it, and they've gone and had a look at it several times on the, the video assistant referee, the VAR, slow mode it down as slowly as you can. And they've managed to just see the most minute touch on the defender's leg. And I think maybe by the letter of the law, they've said, well, that's actually a red card. But now we're looking, when we're slowing things down as much as that, mm. as you can see in the So the, the debate really here, is the letter of the law versus the nature of the game. The nature of the game, um, just the reality of life. I mean, it's yeah. just, it's, yeah, I mean, you know, when you slow it down, it looks bad. But the problem is, of course, in real time, nobody even saw it. And the other thing is, in some of the FA Cup matches this weekend, they won't even have VAR. So if this yeah. game was played at a non-Premier League ground, it wouldn't have even gone to VAR. And so what's the threshold then to bring in VAR? Because if it's available at these grounds, surely you will always then revert to it, won't you? You will always revert to it. I mean, they've got obviously the uh, assistants in their ear telling them uh, they're sat in a studio somewhere. They're looking at every incident that mm. happens penalties, handballs, these kind of things. And it's just something that basically whenever anything like that happens, they're going to be on, on the blower to them in their ear. And then they're going to have to look at a screen as well at the ground if, if it's something that needs further clarification. Mm. Mm. Does it, it take away take... the spirit of the game? Yes, because you can have goals that are scored and then they have to go, oh, no, no, we're going to have to go and check that. And then they go, oh, no, we're not sure if that's going to be allowed. And then they go, oh, it's been allowed. And everyone goes, oh, yeah, happy days. <laughs> exactly. So, exactly. You know. um, should we move on to uh, an apology it. that's had to be made? Because at Sunderland, <laughs> explain to us what happened. You go to watch your team. <laughs> you're not know. expecting the stadium to have decorations of your opponents. You're not. Uh, but what happens is you, you see sometimes opposing fans go to other grounds and they trash the place. Yeah. Um, and th these are two bitter rivals, 14 miles apart, Newcastle and Sudden. Think Arsenal, Tottenham, mm. uh, Real Madrid, Barcelona, this kind of thing. Big rivals. And they've been drawn together in the third round of the FA Cup. They're playing um, this weekend. And so what's happened is, is the home club, which is Sunderland in this case, have decided to dress up, as you can see here, dress up the bar that the Newcastle fans are going to be drinking in with Newcastle, uh, pro-Newcastle messages, basically trying to welcome them in. And the fans have seen this and gone, what on earth are you doing? Why are you making our ground a home for our bitter rivals? But this opponents? is an away bar which will be used by those fans, so I don't really see the massive problem. It's completely unpre... Well, the Sunderland fans have, are so <laughs> upset about it. That <laughs> the club have had to, they've had to issue an apology, this right. Sunderland, uh, saying that this is a gross mis, uh, misjudgment, 
Um, and they're going to look into why, why on earth this is happening. But they hardly dressed it up. They wrote some slogans on the wall. Yeah, but this, these are their bitter rivals. <laughs> yeah, no, I understand. This is just, I mean, uh, the Sunderland fans, it's just gone down appallingly. And they, as I said, they've had to issue an apology. Right. Uh, so they, they obviously acknowledge that they've maybe done something wrong. They haven't really said why they've done it. And, yeah, mm. I mean, it's just... Yeah, embarrassing. <laughs> uh, we just had a little bit of uh, breaking sports news. We knew this was going to happen today, but Oscar Pistorius has been released mm. from prison. Of course, he's the um, Paralympian who murdered his girlfriend. Uh, we'll get more details for you uh, as and when we get them. But should we move on to the darts? Because Luke Littler, oh, my goodness, he kind of stole our hearts, even if he didn't manage he did. to win. But what happens is loads of us who'd never had any interest in darts before all decided to tune in. Well, exactly that. Plenty of us as well. Uh, I mean, millions and millions and millions of us tuned in. The actual, the record for the most, as we as we were saying at the top, the um, the, the the sport event that wasn't football. Uh, these are the most people that have ever watched. Um, something on telly. And the previous record was actually his semi-final um, win against Rob Cross. That was 2.32 million. Uh, we got 4.8 watching Wednesday's final. I mean, we love a story, though, don't we? As you 4. said... 4.8 million? Where have these people come from? And the, the thing is... is I wanted to watch. There I was listening to talk sports because I was exactly, being loyal. That's exactly but it. But I was really... I mean, I never would have watched a game like the darts. wouldn't have been interested at all, but it's the human story. It's the human story. We love a story. I mean, mm. let's face it, darts is not one of the most popular sports. It's, it's getting more and more popular. But you've got, as you, as you said, people like yourself tuning in, going, oh, I really want to see this this 16-year-old. What a yeah. story it is. That's, that's what we do. And, and also, I saw... that. I mean, it was very much a celebratory mood, let's say, wasn't it? Yeah. At, at, at that uh, competition, people all dressed up. It Absolutely. seemed to be a great thing. We were talking earlier, actually. When I was growing up, darts was on the main mm. terrestrial channels. Mm. That doesn't happen anymore. Do you think they'll be ruining the day? Because, obviously, Sky put a lot of money into the darts. Well, the Liberal Democrats were saying the final should be free to free to air. Well, I'm sure the two guys uh, who pocketed uh, in <laughs> yeah. excess of, um, you know, hundreds of thousands of pounds we'll won't, won't no. complain about it. Yeah. Luke Littler's career, he's been admitted, just briefly, into sports, I, I don't really know about this, but the Premier League of Darts, quite a high-pressure, high-stakes competition. It basically, we're going to see him, uh, well, if you have uh, Sky Sports, you're going to see him a lot more on telly because they play that, it's like a series. Think Premier League football, there's a league... The, the top players mm. in the world all face off against each other more regularly because, of course, the um, World Championship is only once a year. So. And he's been sort of fast-tracked in. Absolutely. Well, can you blame them? Look at the guy. No, and, he's and, done fantastic. And also, well. uh, it's just a great story as well. To I'm still in. deeply nervous about his diet. <laughs> I mean, it's really not something I would champion. Luckily, someone's uh, looking out for him. <laughs> Someone definitely is. Jake, yeah. thank you so much. You. Really appreciate your time. Lots more uh, still to come on today's programme. A general election is on the horizon, or is it? We'll be discussing uh, when we can expect the general election this year, or perhaps next year, and what Keir Starmer plans on doing about it. This is Talk Today. A very good morning to you. Thanks for joining us. You're with Talk TV on TV, on radio, online. We're on your smart speaker as well. Criminals using XL bully dogs as weapons to threaten others. No matter how well trained, most dog owners will tell you a dog can turn. Do you know what I love about Talk Today? We do it all. Sunak, Suella, scones. I rather like David Cameron. I don't sort of bear him any ill will because he delivered the referendum that he said he would deliver. The Tories love a scrap. You can almost see this coming round the tracks with Suella Braverman. She's heading up one side and Rishi soon at the other. The police are pro-Palestine. That is just not right. You swear an oath in the police to act without fear or favour. The Covid inquiry seems to have turned into a sort of pantomime. There's not really any substance to it. It's hard to know whether it's a farce or a tragedy. For the amount of time it's taken, the number of illegal migrants currently sent by us to Rwanda, zilch. The amount of money it's cost, we're saying, what are we saying it's cost? About 140 million. 140 million pounds so far. So 140 million pounds so far result nil, absolutely nil. Are we only going to be trusting sources like Meta and Google? Where is our unbiased news going to come from? Calais in winter is cold. <laughs> <laughs> that is from the Jeremy Corbyn book. Kevin O'Sullivan is the worst presenter on talk TV. Sitting on his fat ass, <laughs> talking for a living. If you're walking towards me and you're a vegan, you have a great big orange sticker over here saying, watch out, vegans about. 
weirdest plank that we've had in what, yeah. three years. Hundreds and hundreds of mice in a box, which he walks into a branch of McDonald's. McMouse Man. McMouse Man, yeah. McMouse Man. He should be easy enough to catch this guy, shouldn't he? I mean, he's got a house full of mice. <laughs> <laughs> This is a major summit. President Biden decided this was important after watching a Tom Cruise film. Sunak and the current Conservative government are not conservative. Why don't you leave that party and come to one that actually shares uh, your ideology? This has been a party political broadcast uh, on behalf no, of I the don't. Reform UK party. Hi, I'm Ofcom. Just, just... Kids think all they have to do is take pictures of everything. Just shut down TikTok. Problem solved. This is really unfair. What's, what, what's unfair? If it's on camera, we're not doing the interview. So. Yes, I'm going to do. I'm you're, going going to, to, you're going to resign? Yes, because I cannot continue my work. When I say I am God, I'm not joking. Did you feel Elvis was controlling? I've been answering your question, you answer mine. It's actually not my job to answer your questions. Are you prepared you. to call is Hamas possible, a have, terror group? Is it possible to have a rational you can't, discussion can you? with you? I've asked you two questions. Should Hamas stay in power and are they a terror group? You're refusing to answer either of them. They that won't. is very telling. Talk TV. It's the only place where you get the truth. You've done a book on poetry. Poetry and music for the many. I love poetry. We can agree on that. On TV, on radio, and on your smartphone, this is Talk TV. This is Talk Today with David Ball and Rosie Wright. A very good morning. It is 7 o'clock on Friday the 5th of January. It certainly is. You're with Talk Today on TV, on radio, online and on your smart speaker. Your top stories this morning. Rishi Sunak signals the country will go to the polls in autumn, claiming he wants to keep going to deliver for the British people. But the opposition leader Keir Starmer accuses him of squatting in Downing Street as he vows to fight fire with fire in a general election. And will you be able to stay strong as we head into the first weekend of dry January? We're going live, I'm looking forward to this, to a dry bar to hear about some alcohol-free alternatives to keep you from caving in. And after yet another deluge, we now have over 300 flood warnings in force. The outlook? Well, thankfully, much drier, but it will turn colder. And some of our own news. Yes. Look at this. A message from Nicola to say, we are delighted to say we recently welcomed our beautiful baby daughter into the world. Everything they say about giving birth, being a roller coaster of emotions is true. <laughs> we are shattered and smitten and everything in between. What a lovely photo, actually. It shows just the fragility of a little baby, doesn't it? The tiny little hand there next to Nicola's hand as well. Like, congratulations to you. I have Huge to say, congratulations. She, I mean, she looked amazing right until uh, up until she left Absolutely. the studio. She truly, truly has been uh, glowing. Congratulations. And well done, Nikesh. everyone Kesh. here. Uh, to both of them, <laughs> well, all three of them now. Yes. I should say, that's why I'm here. I'm just looking after Nicola's seat until she gets back and everyone's very excited for her to yeah, return. Amazing, amazing news. And we send our love to you all, all three of you. Yeah. But now it is time for your headlines with Emily. Good morning. The South African Correctional Services Department says the former Paralympian Oscar Pistorius is at home after being freed from prison. The amputee runner shot his girlfriend Reva Steenkamp through a bathroom door 11 years ago, saying he mistook her for a burglar. He'll live under strict conditions until his sentence expires in 2029. Around 300 flood warnings are still in place across parts of the UK as Storm Hank continued to bring heavy rain overnight. A major incident has been declared in Nottinghamshire with hundreds of people evacuated after the River Trent burst its banks. People in the southwest are being warned not to travel by train because of severe delays. A Houthi rebel boat detonated in the Red Sea, but the US Navy says there was no damage or any casualties. Meanwhile, the Foreign Secretary David Cameron says attacks on cargo vessels and shipping lanes have to stop as they're threatening to disrupt global supply chains. Over 10 countries have signed a statement saying to the Houthis, these attacks are unacceptable, they're illegal and they've got to stop. And if they don't stop, action will be taken. The Health Secretary, Victoria Atkins, says she's fully behind hospital bosses, calling on junior doctors to get back to work during the longest strike in NHS history. We're heading into day three of a six-day walkout, and a row's broken out over managers asking doctors to cross picket lines to protect patient safety. 
And there's a new range of stamps dedicated entirely to a female pop group marking the 30th anniversary of the Spice Girls. They feature performances over 15 years, from Jerry Halliwell's Union Jack mini dress in 97 to the closing ceremony of the London Olympics in 2012. Those are the headlines. I'll have another update in half an hour. Thank you very much indeed, Emily. Lots uh, in the papers this morning about the junior doctor's strike. The front page of the Times, the doctors are told the NHS belongs to all of us, not just you. Also, the Telegraph is now saying the NHS to record harms created by striking doctors. Really, the rhetoric ramping up between Victoria Atkins, who is the House Secretary, the junior doctors who are saying the NHS hates us, and many people getting in touch, because we're asking this morning, are you, do you have sympathy with the junior doctors this morning? This particularly struck me. Natasha said, the junior doctors' strike is a monumental embarrassment for the NHS with catastrophic consequences. I cannot believe this is the bit. The med students I have taught over the decades would stoop so low. This demonstrates lack of integrity, professionalism and humanity. Jim says what is immoral and unfair is the government's approach to this. It is somehow OK to write off billions for inheritance tax cuts, but nothing for hardworking doctors who save lives. Well, Jim, the government will say they have given them an offer. 8.8%, mm. then another 3%, and the junior doctors say 35 We'll see how it develops. The other big story um, that's developing today, hundreds of people this morning in flooded homes. Let's get an update from Isabel with the weather. What do we know? Yeah, well, the weather is becoming drier, but the problem is all that rain filtering into the river systems and there'll still be flooding for the next few days, up to five days. If you want to find more information, you can look online at the Environment Agency website and they've got all the flood warnings there. Uh, I was looking at it yesterday and there are about sort of 260 flood warnings at it, uh, around one o'clock yesterday. It's now about 302 flood warnings and you can find out the areas which are most at risk as well for the next few days, and particularly Nottinghamshire and also parts of the south. Let's take a look at the forecast, though, because at least it's more optimistic. Times Radio sponsors Talk TV Weather. We've just been inundated with weather systems coming in from the Atlantic, but thankfully that will stop for a good few days, probably a week or more. The low from yesterday pulling away. We do have this low to the north of Scotland and this trailing front that will bring some cloud and rain for a time, but then high pressure sort of squeezes out the rain and brings us a quieter spell of weather. Colder, yes, some frost and some freezing fog patches and definitely a blast of easterly winds across the south that will make it feel bitter from about Sunday onwards. You'll really notice that. Out there today, well, there's that showery low, still giving rain in East Anglia. This trailing front here pepping up a bit more as we head through the day. It's quite uh, sharp areas of rain just to the east of Aberdeenshire now, and it does look as though that could well come on shore. It'll also affect parts of North East England too, whereas further west it's brighter, but showery. At least sunshine in between those showers, though. Showers for Wales in the southwest, a little bit quieter through central southern England, and then we come back into the cloud, the remnants of yesterday's low. Quite a dull, rather dreary day for some parts of East Anglia in the southeast there, and still quite a cool breeze as well. Temperatures a little bit down on yesterday's. Now, through this evening and tonight, we've still got this sort of streamer of cloud and patchy rain extending right down into the Midlands. Not much on it. It becomes increasingly patchy, but either side of that, I think there'll be some cloud breaks and it will be colder in the west tonight with longer clear spells developing as the showers fade, quite a sharp frost in a few spots and some patchy fog as well for tomorrow morning. And then the start of the weekend, well, not a bad one. There'll be some uh, decent sunny spells across many western areas. Still this zone of rather dreary weather, but I'm hopeful that that patchy rain will tend to fade and it should have pushed away from the eastern side of Scotland as well. So across Scotland, not a bad day, some sunshine, not particularly warm, seven uh, at best. Northern Ireland, some sunshine for Saturday. Wales and western parts of England, just a few coastal showers and sunshine. Elsewhere, a lot of clouds still, but it should break a little bit through the day. It'll start to feel colder and there'll be more frost and fog around over the coming nights and a chilly wind too. Times Radio sponsors Talk TV Weather. Isabel, thank you. To our top story, for Keir Starmer's accused Rishi Sunak of hiding in Downing Street, squatting in Downing Street, in fact, <laughs> using a major speech to launch an attack on the Tory party. Hold on to the flickering hope in your heart that things can be better. Because they can. You can choose it. 
you can choose the hope of national renewal, the responsibility of service, what politics can and should be, and you can reject the pointless populist gestures, the low road cynicism that the Tories believe is all you deserve. Well, this came as the Prime Minister announced he was planning an election for the second half of the year, claiming he had lots of work to do between now and then. Well, let's look at this in more detail. Joining us now is the former Labour official, Richard Pasaid. Thank you so much. And also former Downing Street Director of Communications, Jonathan Haslam. Jonathan, good morning to you too. Um, Jonathan, it was quite a, a well-timed announcement from Rishi Sunak because Keir Starmer's there, ready to lay out his pitch to the public. And Sunak sort of steals the headlines by saying, OK, I'll, I'll flirt with you a little bit and tell you when the election's going to come. Good morning, Rosie, and thank you for that. Yes, it was uh, quite a, a, a very judicious piece of politics from Rishi Sunak. Mm. Uh, there's a bit of a tradition where you have uh, the prime ministers and leaders of parties making their New Year's speech. Uh, this one from Sunak uh, was not a speech. He was out uh, in the countryside uh, making a, a, a question and answer session with various people and a very carefully dropped in piece of information which has taken him to the top of the headlines and really knocked um, Keir Starmer off them. So smart politics, not entirely ruling out the possibility of uh, a May election to coincide with the local elections, but avoiding that problem that Gordon Brown had uh, some years ago when in the autumn of uh, a year he could have gone to the country and uh, he then decided at the last minute, after an awful lot of talk from the politicians around him, that he was, he was going to pull back. Um, and that led to accusations of dithering. Now, here we've got accusations, as you would normally expect from the opposition, of squatting in Downing Street, bring it on. And uh, we're left with this delicious idea now of what is the timing for the election? Because it does get a little bit confusing later on in the year. You have party conference season in September, and uh, I just wonder, maybe uh, he would want to go, Sunak, on October the 19th, which is just two days and five years after Boris Johnson uh, went to the country. Uh, and, of course, Boris Johnson really wanted to go to the country. Well, I mean, uh, it was I mean it's, a, it's an intriguing proposition. And, and actually, the wording was very careful. He said his working assumption, Richard, his working assumption was he was going to call it in the second half of the year. So that actually leaves it wide open. What it does do, I think, is it, it sort of quashes those people who said it was, they, it was going to be held at the same time as the local elections. There was a talk of a super election. But just let's look at what Keir Starmer said he talked about project hope this downtrodden uk he promises renewal of britain was it exciting of course it was <laughs> i mean i'm not entirely sure about what johnson said about um you know uh, uh, uh rishi sunak having won the the battle of the headlines yesterday i mean everyone thinks he bottled it right i'm not sure that's really what you want at the at the do at they the think that? the headlines um, I think if you go and ask uh, people, you know, are you desperate for a general election campaign? No, but would you like a chance to get rid of the Tories? Yes, they would. And this is actually kind of a problem, you know, a fundamental problem with our political system, right? We've uh, got a prime minister who, I mean, of course he's unelected, they're all unelected, but he isn't, he, he hasn't come in on a manifesto. You know, the 2019 manifesto, levelling up, Maybe they never really meant it seriously, but, you know, it's, not, it's gone nowhere, has Talking it? about a so manifesto, we... Richard, I think what we want to know is what's in the <laughs> Labour Party manifesto? We've got a lot of kind of, you know, oh, I feel this. If mm. you want hope, come to us. But what are the policies? £28 you can billion us. a year to achieve a great British uh, energy company. No, but the Labour Party... Which they are rowing back they, on, they possibly, can't. depending on the economy. Um, depending on the fiscal limits, which they always said would be primary. Right. It's caution, though, isn't it? That's what we hear. And, uh, Jonathan, fr from your perspective, you know, it's easy to criticise the Conservatives because, you know, we know exactly... We're all living through uh, exactly the decisions that they've made. Sunak is trying to buy time. He's bought a little bit, but surely not enough. Well, uh, hope springs eternal. Uh, if you mm. look at the five pledges, which uh, <clears throat> actually he made about a year ago, 
during a New Year's speech, which probably uh, inclined him not to make another one this year. Uh, of the five pledges he made, he's he's only got one that he can talk up, and that's inflation. Uh, and that is essentially, of course, the job of the Bank of England. And to the extent that the government's done anything about getting inflation down, uh, it may be by putting taxes up through what's called fiscal drag. So, you know, he's got a long way to go and he does want more time. I and mean, the economic outlook isn't that encouraging, but it could turn around. You know, interest rates, certainly in the marketplace, are falling rather more quickly than people imagined. So we're, most of the electorate, uh, aside from us uh, and Richard in the studio there, are, you know, talking about politics all the time. Most normal people get on with their lives. Mm. And when there's an election, then they focus. And certainly the polls show there are quite a lot of people who really haven't made up their minds at the moment. They're voters who will be taking a decision on the day when they put their ballots through uh, the boxes. So there's lots for Sunak to go for. Uh, he wants to buy more time. And as for Labour, they are, of course, extremely cautious. And one of our papers is uh, talking today about how they were looking at uh, trying to stop retroactive uh, fee paying and uh, the possibility that for private schools they'll impose VAT, which has been spoken of quite a lot. Jonathan, and, is there concern? You know, this is maybe a bit of a lot. vanity project from the Prime Minister to say, I, I want to be in place for two years. Well, why not? I mean, you're going to get uh, a, a limited number of occasions to be or opportunities to be Prime Minister, and two years is good. That puts you in the record books. Uh, but he will be a good Tory, and he'll want to see if he can give them the best possible chance after two chaotic, to put it mildly, prime ministerships, mm. and coming off the back of COVID and coming out of uh, the, all the issues we've seen from the dreadful war in Ukraine. Let's put that to Richard. Richard, um, I, I think what Jonathan was saying was actually the lead, although it is convincing currently, I think is soft. We're seeing changes and fluxes in the poll. The Labour lead isn't as strong as it was before Christmas, for example. The question is, what does the Labour Party have to do here? Jonathan was sort of saying it's all about being cautious, not throwing the baby out with the bathwater. Just, But I do think Rosie's right. People want to know, what does the Labour Party actually stand for going forward? Why should people vote for Labour? Well, this is the thing, right? You ask me that, and I say a policy, and you say, oh, no, not that policy, and then I'll tell you about another policy. Go on, then tell us another one. Well, I, I wanted to finish what I was saying about Great British Energy. That's going to cut people's bills because we'll be domestically producing our green energy, protects our kids' futures, creates hundreds of thousands of jobs in this country, but most importantly for most people right now listening to this, it's going to cut their bills. And the point about that is, right, sure, it's not... Um, uh, you know, it's not controversial, it's not kind of Boris Johnson attention-seeking. That's not what people want. They're looking at Keir Starmer and they're thinking, that's exactly the kind of Prime Minister that this country needs Don't right people want now. cheap energy? Don't people want fracking? Don't people want other sources of energy, nuclear power? Fracking wouldn't make our energy um, uh, cheaper because it would be gas sold on international markets. We wouldn't have any control over the price. That is a whole other debate. Is, yes. <laughs> um, Richard, Jonathan, thank you both so much. It's been great to sort of tease out the details of when that election might be and what pitch both parties are going to make to the public. Still to come here, though, on the programme. Petrol prices may have fallen, but critics say they are still not cheap enough. And, I love this, the Spice Girls <laughs> become the first female group to appear on British stamps. They certainly do. Author Nikki Hodgson and Spike Fraser Myers are back to take us through this morning's papers. Do stay with us. The time is 7.16. Thanks for joining us. You're with Talk TV on TV, on radio, online. We're on your smart speaker as well. Criminals using XL bully dogs as weapons to threaten others. No matter how well trained, most dog owners will tell you a dog can turn. Do you know what I love about Talk Today? We do it all. Sunak, Suella, scones. I rather like David Cameron. I don't sort of bear him any ill will because he delivered the referendum that he said he would deliver. The Tories love a scrap. You can almost see this coming round the tracks with Suella Braverman. She's heading up one side and Rishi soon at the other. The police are pro-Palestine. That is just not right. You swear an oath in the police to act without fear or favour. The Covid inquiry seems to have turned into a sort of pantomime. There's not really any substance to it. It's hard to know whether it's a farce or a tragedy. 
So the amount of time it's taken, the number of illegal migrants currently sent by us to Rwanda, zilch. The amount of money it's cost, we're saying, what are we saying it's cost? About 140 million. 140 million pounds so far. So 140 million pounds so far result nil, absolutely nil. Are we only going to be trusting sources like Meta and Google? Where is our unbiased news going to come from? Calais in winter is cold. <laughs> <laughs> that is from the Jeremy Corbyn book. Kevin O'Sullivan is the worst presenter on talk TV. Sitting on his fat ass, <laughs> talking for a living. If you're walking towards me and you're a vegan, you should have a great big orange sticker over here saying, watch out, vegans about. The weirdest plank that we've had in, what, yeah. three years? Hundreds and hundreds of mice in a box, which he walked into a branch of McDonald's. McMouse Man. McMouse Man, yeah. McMouse Man. He should be easy enough to catch this guy, shouldn't he? I mean, he's got a house full of mice. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> This is a major summit. President Biden decided this was important after watching a Tom Cruise film. Sunak and the current Conservative government are not conservative. Why don't you leave that party and come to one that actually shares uh, your ideology? This has been a party political broadcast uh, on behalf no, of I the don't. Reform UK party. Hi, I'm Ofcom. Just, just... Kids think all they have to do is take pictures of everything. Just shut down TikTok. Problem solved. This is really unfair. What's, what, what's unfair? If it's on camera, we're not doing interviews. Yes, I'm going to do. I'm you're, going going to, you're going to resign? Yes, because I cannot continue my work. When I say I am God, I'm not joking. Did you feel Elvis was controlling? I've been answering your question, you answer mine. It's actually not my job to answer your questions. Are you prepared you. to call is Hamas a terror group? Is it possible to have a rational you can't, can you? you? I've asked you two questions. Should Hamas stay in power and are they a terror group? You're refusing to answer either of them. They that won't. is very telling. Talk TV. It's the only place uh, where you get the truth. You've done a book on poetry. Poetry and music for the many. I love poetry. We can agree on that. Welcome back to Talk Today, it's 20 past 7. Now we'll have the papers in just a moment, but let's give you a quick overview of what else is coming up on the programme. Yes, it is the first Friday of dry January, a real test for those taking part. At quarter to eight, we'll go inside a so-called dry bar to find out about some alcohol-free alternatives to get you through the month. So Keir Starmer has used a major speech to say there are big differences between Labour and the Tories. So what are they? We're going to ask the Shadow Paymaster General, Jonathan Ashworth, just before eight. And as more documents relating to disgraced financier Jeffrey Epstein are released, we'll bring you the latest analysis around 8.30. Right now, though, in the studio again with us are the author and journalist Nikki Hodgson and Spike Deputy Editor Fraser Myers. Good morning again to both Good of morning. you. Fraser, should we start with The Sun? Inside the pages... Um, must think we're fuels, is the headline. This is about petrol prices. Yeah, so this is the news that it's uh, 5p cheaper to fill up your tank in Northern Ireland if you go to the big supermarkets than it is um, in the rest of the UK. Uh, and there is obviously no discernible reason for this because the, uh, you know, the oil price is a, it's a global phenomenon, effectively. Um, what's interesting, though, there, I mean, this is, there is some good news. Um, the price of filling the average tank has gone down by £3.40 in just the last month. Uh, fuel prices have gone back to their sort of pre-Ukraine days. Um, mm. But, you know, there's trouble on the horizon. You know, mm. we've seen what's happening in the Middle East with the Houthis attacking ships. Lots of companies Indeed. don't want to, uh, you know, the price of oil is going up generally because it's become more difficult to transport oil around the world. Domestically, you know, net zero, we're turning against uh, oil. People aren't actually buying uh, electric cars, but politicians want to cut off the oil taps uh, anyway. So, you know... And you're right, there's a spiralling cost of living, people really struggling to get about, putting petrol in their cars. I was just looking here. The RAC reckons the big four store chains are pocketing 13p profit on every litre of fuel sold. That's double the amount in 2021. That, that's iniquitous. Exactly. And, and so the government is saying that, you know, there should be a full publication of fuel prices so people can make comparisons. I mean, everyone knows that... You know, there are certain petrol stations that are more expensive than others. We should be able to check in advance, shouldn't we? We should. You know, look, on, look online. A, yes, we that, that would be an amazing, of that you know, amazing database. I think, I think so. if you're sort of really diligent and you've got the time, there are websites where you can kind of yeah. check out where you should go closest to you. Uh, 
what do, what do you think the answer is this to, to the, this, Nikki? Because, you know, we, the consumer, we're stuck. We're just going to go the place that's closest, convenient and hopefully cheapest. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, you know, the government could do something to step in and keep prices at a certain level if they wanted to. And that would probably be a vote winner. Maybe Bishy Sunak should do that, actually, if he wants to kind of I mean, there's certainly around. a huge campaign from Fair Fuel, yeah, for example, absolutely. to try to lower the duty on, on, yeah. on petrol. And, and, of course, the problem is that these, these prices are always passed on to everyone who travels, even if you don't drive, you know, if you take the bus. Eventually, your prices, the price of your fares, will go up because of the rise in price, the price of, of goods because yes, of uh, exactly. <laughs> the transport. So really, it has a knock-on effect. But your point's really interesting. The government pushing people into electric cars, yeah. the people not convinced about electric cars, no. and at the same time being priced off the roads because of the price of fuel. Absolutely, and even you know the government is going to ban the sale of electric cars in 2035. They say. But what they forget is that the vast majority of people actually buy second-hand cars. And there's no electric car market for second-hand cars. So people are going to be continuing... People will be using petrol cars to way beyond the net zero. And well, also the price the government an electric car is, is far higher, isn't it? Yeah, for, way too, Way too high. And the only competitors are the Chinese models, which, you know, we're so scared uh, <laughs> that they're going to undercut... Um, our own cars that we're slapping tariffs on them. So, and of Chinese tech in general. Yeah. You know, cars that have surveillance in them and <laughs> all this idea because well, well, you know, we worried about the phones. Yeah. Should we move on from petrol to taxes? Yes. Nikki, in More the joy. Telegraph, <laughs> pensioners, this is the story, pensioners could pay the price of funding labour tax cuts for working people. What's the argument they've come up with? OK, so this is a story that's broken every two days. And actually, yesterday's tape was a bit simpler to understand, so I might <laughs> refer to that. It's basically saying that uh, back in March, um, Rachel Reeves, the Shadow Chancellor, pledged to reverse the abolition of the lifetime allowance that you can have on pensions. So basically, pensions over 1.073 million uh, will now, potentially by Labour, be taxed. So basically what's happening is loads of people who've got those big pension pots are worrying about it. They're trying to cash their pensions in early. They're also uh, planning on retiring before the next election so they don't get caught in that gap. And obviously we've got this huge crisis in this country with our workforce anyway. We've been going to so many sectors saying we want older workers, to, we want to retain them. Well, and also this goes back to the doctor's strike because yeah. the fact is that actually it was the abolition of that which persuaded many consultants to stay in the NHS. Here Labour is saying they support the NHS and at the right. same time by doing that they will actually call the consultants to leave. Yeah, and, you know, at, at the end of the day, there's a just sort of a basic point of fairness. You've already paid tax on the money that's, you know, going into your pension. Why pay it again? I, th I think the older people get a lot of uh, bashing uh, these days. You know, people say pensioners are also well off, they're also wealthy. But they're you know, not. But they're not really. I mean, it's, it's, it seems very unfair. Although, I mean, the flip side of it is giving tax cuts to working people, I think it, it is a good move. The problem is that Labour has got itself into a muddle where it wants to stick to the Conservative sort of overall spending mm. plans and won't deviate from that because it's scared that it will be accused of, you know, being, uh, you know, economically illiterate or something like that. So they're having to scrimp and save in, in all different ways. They're, they're basically promising austerity is what... And the, the problem for the Labour the Party is where are they going to find that money Always. to pay for the... Well, the we don't really know yet, no. do we? Well, no, I mean, the thing I always say is tax the very rich, tax corporations that don't pay enough tax. You mm. know, that, that's where that's a very obvious place. Go to tax avoidance, sort all that stuff out. But um, nobody will ever do that because they're scared they'll and this scare goes, all the millionaires. But it goes back to the bigger point, mm. which I made to Richard, which is what does Labour stand for? Mm. So let's say, for example, in inheritance tax, they again this morning have said they would reverse any scrapping of inheritance tax. Now, you may argue it doesn't affect that many people, but actually we know the vast majority of these people, uh, yeah. people in this country feel it is iniquitous and increasingly, to be taxed again. And increasingly, you know, with the rise of property prices, a property that somebody had 20 years ago, the value now is just so different. You know, as a family, you might have planned for not having to pay it, and now you do have to pay it. You know, it's like... You might say it's a, it's a middle bracket of people, but actually, because of the rise in prices, it's affecting more and more. And again, you're completely right. It's, they didn't plan for it. They weren't expecting it, so why should they have to do it now? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Inside the Times, Fraser, this story that's really been going on for years, really trying to work out exactly what is at the heart of this. Harvard Head is the headline that shows how far academia has sunk. For anyone who isn't familiar with the story, can you remind us? Yeah, so um, Harvard's president has resigned uh, this week. Uh, she's the shortest serving um, president of Harvard. She's only been in the job for six months. Um, Claudine Gay, her name is. Her. She kind of came to controversy about a month ago when she was uh, grilled in front of the US Congress. Uh, there were questions being asked about anti-Semitism on uh, university campuses. And it was interesting because she gave this almost like free speech defense of anti-Semitism. Now, you might think, fair enough, America has a First Amendment, they have robust protections for free speech, all very mm -hmm. good. But it 
rankled with people because obviously people will know that universities are very, very censorious places usually. You know, you cannot commit a microaggression on Harvard. And yet there we had the president of Harvard saying, well, it might not be a mis misconduct to call for the genocide of Jews. So people were seeing this, people were, you know, open mouth. Now, another Ivy League um, president who was being grilled at the time resigned immediately. Uh, Claudine Gay, a kind of cloud hung over her. But since then, it's been exposed that she essentially has plagiarized um, over 40 pieces of work. <laughs> now, plagiarism is the cardinal sin of academia. Mm -hmm. And again, when this was exposed, she didn't resign. She hung on for a long time. She said the attacks on her are racist. Now all of this has come out. It, it, it's very clear that actually her academic record was incredibly thin. She'd published about uh, 11 articles in 20 years. She's never written a book. It's kind of the amount of work that an academic might be expected to do, to do in a year. So is the argument that she used the freedom of speech as a bit of a smokescreen to cover up the allegations of the plagiarism? Uh, I think the argument is really that she essentially is a kind of uh, embodiment of what you, of the sort of diversity, equity, inclusion agenda. This was someone who was very, very unqualified, um, but she spoke the right language. She was, mm. you know, a very clear but woke that begs ideologue. The question, how did she get that job in the first well, place? If she was well, exactly. unqualified by, for that job, by touting her her race, but also by touting her sort of woke. Uh, but you know, probably beliefs. also cronyism, because actually, if you think about academia, you know, it's always people that know each other that end up in the top jobs. Yeah. I've got friends that are academics. There, they work ridiculous hours. They're incredibly bright. They do so much work for other people, especially if they're working in health, for example. And yet, if they don't know the right, you know, dean or whatever of the university, they often won't get a job. It's it's very, very uh, locked in in terms of who you know, not just in terms of do you look right for the profile of the university. Yeah, and she's going to resume her faculty position, so she's not actually leaving the university. So, so again, isn't that a reward? Yeah, yes. She's, she's resigned in disgrace, but will still earn nine hundred thousand dollars. Which is oh, absolutely yeah. abysmal. <laughs> I mean, Harvard should be ashamed of itself because what is the point if you're a student of actually producing original work if that's the reward for somebody so high up? And and I agree with you about the plagiarism. It's a huge problem in universities, of course, and the use of. AI and yeah. um, bots, for example, mm. to, to produce your dissertations now. And she was caught lifting just giant chunks out of other people's work. But again, because of the, um, the sort of identity politics that surrounds academia, she was able to say for quite a long time, no, this is just racist. Uh, people are just out to get me on the basis of uh, my race. And she, she survived for, it's amazing she survived as long as she did. Well. She's yep. still in academia, but, you know. We've got mm. a statement from Harvard who say, uh, well, President Gay has acknowledged missteps and has taken responsibility for them. It's also true she's shown remarkable resilience in the face of deeply personal and sustained attacks. Mm. Should we leave sort of that scandal there and talk about a another one? And you mentioned the word shame. Deep shame from the post office. And ITV have sh been showing this yeah. series, which has really cast the story back into the spotlight. Um, writing inside the mirror, we've heard from the reporter who first kind of broke the story and investigated this. Yeah, so this is Rebecca Thompson writing, who originally reported on this post office scandal in 2009 when she was working at Computer Weekly. And, you know, what we know about this scandal is that hundreds of sub uh, postmasters in the UK were accused of stealing funds from their own post offices because there was a problem, a technical glitch with the software yeah. that was being used, uh, which, was, which was provided by Fujitsu. Now, you know, even today, we have no justice for hundreds of those people. Mm. You know, they had to empty out their life savings. Uh, local villages raised funds to kind of basically, you know, avoid them going to prison. Some of them did go to prison. Some of them took their own lives. Mm. And yet, we, you know, this, this ITV drama is very brilliantly shedding light, the hum you know, the human aspect of the suffering of these people and the injustice that was done. And why is it still in, you know, 2024 that they haven't got justice? Mm. It's truly appalling. It is, and you're right that the word that you use so correctly there is suffering. They were dragged through it. Yeah. As you said, it changed their lives forever. They, yeah. they, they lost everything, their reputation, their money, everything. And actually, reputation is the worst thing to lose in many ways. Indeed. You know, money you can make more of, or maybe you can't, but it's the fact that they were accused of lying, of stealing when they were never those things. We've yeah. spoken to some of the sub-postmasters wrongly convicted on on Talk Today even just this week. For now, we'll leave both of you. Yeah. Thank you very much. Join us in an hour. Nikki and Fraser will see you very shortly. Yes, uh, they'll be back, as Rosie says, in just under an hour. Now, though, it's time for your news update with Emily. Good morning. The former Paralympian Oscar Pistorius has been freed from prison 11 years after murdering his girlfriend. South African officials say he's now at home under strict parole rules, including no drinking. The amputee runner shot Reva Steenkamp through a bathroom door, saying he mistook her for a burglar. 
Labour's accused Rishi Sunak of squatting in Downing Street after he suggested the next general election will be held in the second half of the year. There's been speculation about whether he'd call a vote in May alongside local elections, but the Prime Minister says he needs more time to let tax cuts take effect. Well, the deputy political editor of The Sun, Ryan Sabies, told us that Rishi Sunak had little choice. Rishi Sunak just had to signal somewhere along the line in the first few weeks of January that the general election wasn't going to be held in the next few months because the pressure would just build. You can just imagine the situation in February or March this year when the ums and ahs, he doesn't, he decides not to have an election in May. Labour would be all over it. And I think he just had a signal somewhere along the line that that election was going to be in the latter part of the year. And almost 300 flood warnings are still in place across England and Wales with a major incident declared in Nottinghamshire. Hundreds of people there have been evacuated from their homes after Storm Henk brought heavy rain and rail passengers in the southwest are being warned not to travel if possible. I'll be back with more news at 8 o'clock. Super, thank you very much indeed. Uh, Emily, lots of messages coming in this morning about the junior doctor's strikes as well. I'm, I'm really struck by some of these. Um, Nia says, I cannot fathom how NHS can ask to take our relatives out of the hospital. This, again, was something that I was completely shocked by. The fact is that uh, many of the hospitals were saying, come and pick up your, your relatives. We need the beds. Um, so that is what Nia is saying. It's nearly impossible to admit them unless they're gasping for their last breath. Natasha, good morning, says the junior doctor strike is a monumental embarrassment for the NHS with catastrophic consequences. I cannot believe, says Natasha, that the medical students I've taught would stoop so low. You were mentioning earlier, I, I didn't you know, do, yeah. you've had experience in this in this field to work out, you know, ultimately people have got sympathy with the doctors, but also with the government to say, you know, we can't just be held to ransom here. Keep your views coming yeah. in. We'd love to hear from you. Text, talk, and your message to 8722. Also, I'm just wondering this morning, also, just looking at uh, politics generally, do you think it's become so venomous between all the parties? Let us know. Is it too venomous? Should we take the sting out of politics? First, though, it's time for the weather with Isabel. Yeah, and it is a gentler, gentle, sort of quieter outlook, which is great news. We need that. It's been so wet for weeks. Eight named storms as well. I mean, awful weather. Over 300 flood warnings, 304 when I just looked. Let's take a look at what we can expect weather-wise, because thankfully, high pressure will build in and settle things down. <laughs> Times Radio sponsors Talk TV Weather. If you were driving in the rain yesterday, it really was atrocious. Heavy rain, 30 or 40 millimetres in places. Luckily, that low is now pulling away eastwards and it's a drier prospect for today. Showers for the west, but there will be this frontal system here just trailing from eastern Scotland into central areas for a time and then that will sort of uh, fizzle out as high pressure builds in through the weekend and into the start of next week. Chilly winds around the southern flank of that high, though, and an easterly wind is definitely a cold direction. So if you live in the south, you'll notice that from Sunday onwards. Well, today, then, that rain across East Anglia slowly fading. This is the area of cloud and rain that we'll watch today from eastern Scotland across parts of northeast England, trailing down into the Peak District. West of that, there will be showers, but there should be some brighter spells as well. Hopefully a bit more sunshine to come through the afternoon across western Scotland. The same goes for Northern Ireland. This northerly breeze bringing a few heavy showers to Wales in the southwest, but maybe a little brighter here through the afternoon, whereas for the Midlands and eastwards, it stays on the cloudy side, although the rain does tend to peter out, as I said. Temperatures struggling a little, probably high of 7 in Aberdeen, 9 for Southampton. And then as we head through this evening and tonight, western areas look clearest, so this is where it'll be coldest with a touch of frost. But across uh, more central and eastern parts, particularly of England, there'll be some patchy rain around, still a lot more clouds. So here, temperatures holding up nearer, say, 4 or 5 degrees. But the rain, thankfully, not amounting to much, just a millimetre or two. The west, though, seeing temperatures dipping below freezing in a few spots. And if you're out and about this weekend, although there'll be a bit more sunshine around and drier weather, it will feel colder. Times Radio sponsors Talk TV Weather. Isabel, thank you. Plenty more still to come here, including decisions over dry January. Is it right to take part if our pubs are paying the price? One pub owner tells us his trade falls by half during the booze-free period. Plus, the author and the wellness guru, Davina Taylor, reveals what life is like after a decade of giving up the drink. Yep, this is Talk Today. A very good morning to you.
thanks for joining us. You're with Talk TV on TV, on radio, online. We're on your smart speaker as well. Criminals to using XL bully dogs as weapons to threaten others. No matter how well trained, most dog owners will tell you a dog can turn. Do you know what I love about Talk Today? We do it all. Sunak, Suella, scones. I rather like David Cameron. I don't sort of bear him any ill will because he delivered the referendum that he said he would deliver. The Tories love a scrap. You can almost see this coming round the tracks with Suella Braverman. She's heading up one side and Rishi soon at the other. The police are pro-Palestine. That is just not right. You swear an oath in the police to act without fear or favour. The Covid inquiry seems to have turned into a sort of pantomime. There's not really any substance to it. It's hard to know whether it's a farce or a tragedy. The amount of time it's taken, the number of illegal migrants currently sent by us to Rwanda, zilt. The amount of money it's cost, we're saying, what are we saying it's cost? About 140 million. 140 million pounds so far. So 140 million pounds so far result nil, absolutely nil. Are we only going to be trusting sources like Meta and Google? Where is our unbiased news going to come from? Calais in winter is cold. <laughs> <laughs> that is from the Jeremy Corbyn book. Kevin O'Sullivan is the worst presenter on talk TV. Sitting on his fat ass, <laughs> talking for a living. If you're walking towards me and you're a vegan, you should have a great big orange sticker over here saying, watch out, vegans about. The weirdest plank that we've had in, what, yeah. three years? Hundreds and hundreds of mice in a box, which he walked into a branch of McDonald's. McMouse Man. McMouse Man, yeah. McMouse Man. He should be easy enough to catch this guy, shouldn't he? I mean, he's got a house full of mice. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> This is a major summit. President Biden decided this was important after watching a Tom Cruise film. Sunak and the current Conservative government are not conservative. Why don't you leave that party and come to one that actually shares uh, your ideology? This has been a party political broadcast uh, on behalf no, of I the don't. Reform UK party. Hi, I'm Ofcom. Just, just... Kids think all they have to do is take pictures of everything. Just shut down TikTok. Problem solved. This is really unfair. What's, what, what's unfair? If it's on camera, we're not doing the interviews. Yes, I'm going to do. I'm you're, going going to, you're going to resign? Yes, because I cannot continue my work. When I say I am God, I'm not joking. Did you feel Elvis was controlling? I've been answering your question, you answer mine. It's actually not my job to answer your questions. Are Definitely you prepared you. to call is Hamas possible, a have, terror group? Is it possible to have a rational you can't, discussion can you? with you? I've asked you two questions. Should Hamas stay in power and are they a terror group? You're refusing to answer either of them. They that won't. is very telling. Talk TV. It's the only place uh, where you get the truth. You've done a book on poetry. Poetry and music for the many. I love poetry. We can agree on that. Welcome back to Talk Today. It is 20 minutes to eight. Now, we're five days into the new year. And for those of you, like me, doing dry January, you're coming up to the first major hurdle, the weekend. New research reveals that eight and a half million people in the UK plan on cutting back on their alcohol intake this January. Yeah, and a recent YouGov poll has found that almost half of Britain's youngest drinkers are turning down the booze. So how is the so-called sober generation impacting the pub industry. Well, our reporter Nick Ellaby has hit the bars early this morning to find out, but he'll struggle to find a drink there. Uh, Nick, very good to see you. Tell us where exactly you are today. Morning, David. Morning, Rosie. I'm surrounded by all these incredible drinks with no alcohol. I'm at Club Soda. It's an alcohol-free bar and shop in central London. And I'm here with the founder as well, uh, Laura Willoughby. Laura, just tell us you know, about this place and, and why you set it up. So I gave up drinking um, 11 years ago. And so I set up Club Soda in 2015 so that people had somewhere to go to look at changing their drinking. And people used to moan to me about the fact there wasn't any good choices at pubs or bars or restaurants. So we've been campaigning ever since for better choices when you're out. Right. And then suddenly things have arrived. So you can come here and taste alcohol-free drinks. Absolutely. We've got a few things to taste here. You've got this red wine. Tell us about this wine. It's not just about not drinking, but it's also about cutting down as well. So just tell us about this red wine. I'll have a try. Yeah, so this is Naughty Rouge. It's, um, a, red, it's a red wine from Amanda Thompson. It's probably one of the best-selling wines in the UK. And um, everyone always thinks it's really hard to crack a wine, and I think we're getting there. It's started with beers, but wine is, is coming up. What do you think? Oh, yeah, it's very, I mean, it's very fruity. 
It's not quite as full-bodied as, as an alcohol wine, but it tastes good. You've got some white here as well. Tell us about yeah, this. Yeah, so basically this is Zeno. It's made by David. This is brand new. You should be able to find this in Waitrose as well. Oh, yeah, great, great smell. And again, you know, these wines have been dealkalized, so it's quite hard work to get that body and mouthfeel back in. And so you will notice a slight difference. But when you're having a meal... Yeah, this is perfect. It's a great fruity, a bit lychee. Love that. Um, so, yeah, so we've got a great range of wines here that people can come and, and try. And you've got spirits and beer as well? Spirits and beer. Honestly, I didn't know what to pick for you today. There was so much. But as it's the morning, I thought you might want some three-spirit livener. Oh, yes, please. So this is what I'd call a mood-enhancing spirit. Right. It's full of natural ingredients that lift your mood. And this one's got natural sources of caffeine. Give that a bit of a go. Feel a bit Ooh, of heat. Yes, love that. A bit of ginger in there. A bit of ginger, a bit of heat. Goes beautifully in a cocktail. I feel better already. I have to say, I have a shot of this before I go out clubbing, so... Laura, tell me who are your customers, because we know young people are drinking less. Are you seeing more young people in here? Definitely, and we can see that that's changing even more every 18 to 24-year-old category, every time it moves on. But it's a cross-generational trend. It's just different reasons why people are changing their drinking. Yeah. So we see everybody here. And obviously, younger people aren't drinking very much wine. So older people are coming in for the wines. Yeah. Um, younger people want spirits and cocktails. And what's this one another spirit, is it? Yeah, so this is a spirit. This is an Italian aperitif. It's from Everleaf. This is made by a guy who runs a great... Uh, called Paul, who runs a great um, chain of cocktail bars in London. Okay. He's designed three expressions of Everleaf. This is a bit more like an Italian bitters. Give that All a go. Right. It's got a little... Bit of tonic in it. Cheers, everyone. Italian bitters. Bit of tonic. Mmm. Actually, I do like these. I like these spirits. OK, we've got a beer as well. Just very quickly, Laura, before we finish, peer pressure's big, isn't it, about changing behaviours and that kind of thing. Where can people find out more and maybe meet like-minded individuals that do want to cut down a little bit this year? There's loads of communities online. You can join ours on Club Soda. But, you know, um, go out to your pub. Things have changed. They've got great choices. January isn't about staying at home. It's about trying a new behaviour in a familiar setting. And All you right. can get beers like Big Drop on Draft. Thank you. And I suspect you quite enjoy that. Guys, new behaviour in familiar setting. That's what it's all about. Cheers, everyone. Cheers to that, Cheers definitely. To you. Nick, Laura, thank you both so much. <laughs> well, Dry January, I do think, has plenty to offer. I really like the non-alcoholic beers that you can get, which is fun. So there are things for the sober crowd. Mm. But what is the impact on the pub industry? Can it afford for all of us to say we're going to give up the drink? We're joined by Simon Delaney, owner of the Furbank Pub in Manchester, whose trade is down over 50% during dry January. Thank you so much uh, for your time. We're also joined by the author and uh, alcoholic turned wellness guru, Davina Taylor. Davinia Taylor, sorry, who's celebrated over a decade of sobriety. Thank well, that is absolutely amazing. It um, is. Simon, let's start with you if we can. Um, this time of year, presumably, you want punters coming in. How much of an impact can you see behind the tills from us doing dry January? It, it's a massive impact. You know, historically, um, trade drops, so uh, anything from 50%, 75%. Um, and over the years, I, I've been in this particular pub for nearly 30 years, and we've always learned to deal with it. But now, because of the way um, the, the overheads and the massive overheads that hospitality is, is, is uh, faced with, it's a big problem. So anything that deters people uh, to come through the door is a, it's a massive impact. And we have to do everything we can to try and get the people through the door. And I'll be honest with you, I promote anything that you know, helps better health uh, and, and if they've got to abstain from alcohol, and I'm all for that. Uh, mm. But what we've got to try and not do is have an unsociable January because that's what you find people stay in and that's not good and, and I want to get people through the door and as Laura was just explaining there um, she's got a massive selection there of non-alcohol um, drinks and we have here so but it's that stigmatism we've, we've not drinking and that's what I think we've got to try and change you know all four people not having alcohol but what I need is people to still socialize still come through the door mm. and have human interaction rather than sitting in who wants to sit in this horrible <laughs> January, really well. I mean, I you think know, you make a brilliant point. Hat. Well, I think you make a brilliant point that actually when people don't tend to drink alcohol, they don't go to the pub. And actually, we need to fight to keep our pubs. They need to be there as centres where people can meet and talk yeah. and communicate with each other. Let's move on to you now, Davinia. Your, your own experience, um, you, you used to drink alcohol. You then say in your own words, you, you crossed almost an invisible line. Yeah, yeah, that was like 15 years ago, actually. And it was after I had my first son. So I had a bolt out of the blue with postnatal depression and I leaned on what I only, I only knew that worked, which was white wine. 
to boost my mood. Obviously, that wasn't the right medicine. I was self-medicating. And once I crossed that invisible line, I couldn't have one without having to have another 10. So all bets are off for me. But um, when it comes to the pub, I still go to the pub all the time. I live in Clitheroe and I hate cooking and I'm surrounded by amazing pubs that sell fantastic food. I go in for the food and the fact I've got four lads and I just can't be bothered <laughs> doing a roast dinner every Sunday. So I'm still a pub person. I still, I love people watching. This isn't my house. This is Glen Eagles. I'm here like in the home of oh. whiskey. Stone cold sober because I love coming to hotels and I love socializing. I am a nosy person by nature. Just because I don't drink doesn't shut me up, you know? So I'm with you. I think the pubs need to stay open. Yeah. I think the supermarket needs to stop selling cheap booze, to be honest. That's where the problem lies. That's where the binge drinking is. And, and that's can I, just I, ask, can I ask you, though, Davinia, you, you yeah. said you couldn't have one drink without having many drinks. Did you actually yeah. then take a step back and think about the health implications of alcohol? The fact is it causes you liver damage, for example, multiple cancers. Is that what actually stopped you? Well, yeah, I mean, but that I, ha I had to stop because I couldn't stop. So I, I had to go completely cold turkey. So I, I'm an all or nothing person. You know, I can get addicted to absolutely blooming anything. And it's actually bread at the moment, which is my bugbear. But that's another story altogether. No, I crossed that invisible line. And like any alcoholic, it's a disease. You can't, I mean, there's a saying, I cannot unpickle myself from a gherkin back into a cucumber. I am saturated. <laughs> I hit my quota back in the 90s and I'm not going to go back. And for me, it's a freedom. So I know I'm not going to have a hangover. I know I can hit the gym. I know I'm there for my kids. I know I see a sun. I, we're not going to see much of a sunlight here, but, you know, a sunrise, a sunset. I feel emotional connection to the world, which sounds a bit woo-woo, but it's an energy you get from not having alcohol in your liver, which, I mean, the thing is with alcohol, like it or not, even one glass of wine affects your deep sleep. Mm. And for me, sleep is the cornerstone for me feeling good for the rest of the day. So it, I, I know people say it helps them get to sleep, but you can take supplements like L-theanine, which I'm sure is in that lady's um, botanicals that she sells. It change, You can change your mood without alcohol. I, I mean, think it'd be fun to go back to Simon, to me, just, just for time. Simon, if we sure. came to your pub and you were going to... If I said, give me a non-alcoholic drink, what would you pick? We've got gins, we've got lagers, we've got ciders, we've got wines. Not as massive selection as what, uh, was it Laura had at Club Soda? Mm. Um, but we have a, a, a great selection. You can even just come in, we've diversified so much. Come in and have a coffee, come in and have a nice, mm -hmm. you know, macchiato, have, have a latte. You know, you don't have to come to a pub. It's not about alcohol. We've diversified the industry over over the years. And like you said, come and have great food with a soft drink. And, and that's what it's it's all about we have to sort of like move away from the alcohol yeah because i'm the, i'm the same and you know i have a if i drink I, I'll, I'll have a few glasses of wine and i'll have a massive hangover and i get that and if people want to move away from that that's great we've got everything here so for you to still have a great experience and it in a pub, brilliant. Food, Simon entertainment, Davinia, anything. <laughs> just for time thank you so much really appreciate it and good luck to everyone who's uh, on dry january thank and you. encouraging them to have this non-alcoholic drinks now Labour have accused Rishi Sunak of leaving families £1,200 worse off despite his Chancellor promising to cut taxes. Jonathan Ashworth, Shadow Paymaster General, joins me from Wellingborough. Uh, Jonathan, a very good morning to you. Look, Keir Starmer made it very clear. He good said morning. there are huge policy differences between the Labour Party and the Conservatives. Just tell us some of them. Well, if there's a, a young couple watching talk TV this morning and wants to get on the housing ladder, well, I can tell them that a Labour government is going to radically reform the planning rules, which means we're going to build a million and a half new homes for people, affordable homes. Where might you and build them, And if that young Jonathan? couple wants to start a family, uh, if that young couple wants to start a family, then we're going to deliver free breakfast clubs in every primary school. And if that family, God forbid, fall ill, they'll get NHS treatment because we're going to deliver two million more appointments in the NHS more dentistry appointments. We're going to speed up cancer diagnosis by investing in state-of-the-art equipment. We're going to deliver more mental health care provision. So that's just an example of a set of policies which will materially benefit the lives of a young couple watching talk TV this morning. So I do believe there is a big difference between the Conservatives, who have given us 14 years of decline, and a Labour government who is offering a new programme of hope for the future. So that potentially sounds really exciting, Jonathan. I think what we want to understand is 
where are you going to find the money to pay for it? Because what we're hearing is, you know, you're not going to cut taxes, are you? Can you give us a bit of clarity? Well, as you know, uh, working people are paying so much more in tax, 25 Tory tax rises, which means working people and households on average are, are worse off to the tune of £1,200 under the Conservatives. So people are really struggling at the moment. Uh, people's living standards have been squeezed under the Conservatives. But what we do believe is that we can grow the economy, raise living standards, but there are some tax loopholes that we want to close. One of them is called the non-DOM tax loophole, where we believe that people who are living here should pay their taxes here. If we close that loophole, we can raise money and put that money into the National Health Service to deliver faster cancer diagnosis, to deliver better mental health care provision and to deliver two million more appointments. That £1,200 you talk about, though, there, that's because uh, the Conservatives have kept those tax thresholds frozen. Presumably then, because you've said your policies would be different to the Conservatives, you would unfreeze those tax thresholds. Can you... Sorry, I completely missed that question. Okay, the, very uh, noisy there. The local um, authorities, you, excellent street cleaning processes you're, there. You're talking, Jonathan, about that £1,200, and that's because the Conservatives have frozen the tax thresholds. You've also said you've got different policy ideas to them and they'd be better off under you. Would you unfreeze those tax thresholds? Well, the issue here, though, is that we will always be disciplined and prudent with the public finances. We will never make irresponsible, unfunded, uncosted commitments. And we've got to be honest with the British public on that. We saw what happened when the, when the Conservatives were reckless with the public finances. It's led to them pushing the economy off a cliff, uh, uh, run on pension funds, and people are paying more on their mortgage as a consequence. Every commitment we put forward will be fully costed uh, and fully funded. So we're not going to make unfunded commitments. There will be a general election, probably later in the year now, because Rishi Sunak is running scared, and there's going to be a number of events before that general election, like a budget and so on. So we'll make, have to make an assessment of the public finances. But the priority has to be growing the economy. And if you grow the economy, you can raise living standards. People are paying more in tax because the failure of the Conservatives, they're not having an economic plan, but it not being sounds, able to grow Jonathan, the economy over the last 40 years sufficiently. But it sounds, Jonathan, as they've been still paying that £1,200 extra that you're criticising the Conservatives of under, under Labour as well. And when you make promises, one big policy announcement we have heard about is that £28 billion a year, the Green Prosperity Fund. But now we hear all the figures are sliding on that as well. No, we've always said that our investment plans are subject to clear fiscal rules because we know what happens when governments are irresponsible and reckless with the public finances. That has always been the case. But as we invest in the green jobs of the future to bring energy bills down and create those good, well-paying jobs across the country, we have always said that we'll be uh, subject to clear fiscal rules, but we've also said we want to work in partnership with the business community to leverage in private capital investment in, our, in, uh, in jobs and infrastructure because we know that we've not had that. We've not had that partnership with businesses that the business community is crying out for. So we'll deliver stability, we'll deliver a clear approach to the public finances and work in partnership with our business community to create good, well-paying jobs. Final thing, Jonathan, how would you stabilise uh, the current situation with the junior doctors on strike? Would you say, OK, the junior doctors will meet with you even while they're behind the picket lines? You've got to negotiate with the doctors, but equally, look, none of us uh, believe that we, the, the demands that are being put on the table, um, uh, you know, we've not said that that can be met, but there's got to be a negotiation. There has to be a negotiation. It's really incumbent now on ministers to get the get round a table and hammer out and negotiate this because people do not want to see their quality of care in the NHS so disrupted by ongoing industrial action. Jonathan, we have to leave it there. Thank you so much for your time. Busy street cleaning behind you. Jonathan Ashworth, uh, really appreciate it. Yes, yeah, still more to come. Uh, we're going to be speaking uh, to a landlord trying to see the funny side despite his pub being flooded three times in the past year. This is Talk Today. The time is 7.56. Thanks for joining us. You're with Talk TV on TV, on radio, online. We're on your smart speaker as well.
criminals to using XL bully dogs as weapons to threaten others. No matter how well trained, most dog owners will tell you a dog can turn. Do you know what I love about sport today? We do it all. Sunak, Suella, scones. I rather like David Cameron. I don't sort of bear him any ill will because he delivered the referendum that he said he would deliver. The Tories love a scrap. You can almost see this coming round the tracks with Suella Braverman. She's heading up one side and Rishi soon at the other. The police are pro-Palestine. That is just not right. You swear an oath in the police to act without fear or favour. The Covid inquiry seems to have turned into a sort of pantomime. There's not really any substance to it. It's hard to know whether it's a farce or a tragedy. For the amount of time it's taken, the number of illegal migrants currently sent by us to Rwanda, zilt. The amount of money it's cost, we're saying, what are we saying it's cost? About 140 million. 140 million pounds so far. So 140 million pounds so far result nil, absolutely nil. Are we only going to be trusting sources like Meta and Google? Where is our unbiased news going to come from? Calais in winter is cold. <laughs> <laughs> that is from the Jeremy Corbyn book. Kevin O'Sullivan is the worst presenter on talk TV. Sitting on his fat ass <laughs> talking for a living. If you're walking towards me and you're a vegan, you have a great big orange sticker over here saying, watch out, vegans about. The weirdest plank that we've had in, what, yeah. three years? Hundreds and hundreds of mice in a box, which he walks into a branch of McDonald's. McMouse Man. McMouse Man, yeah. McMouse Man. He should be easy enough to catch this guy, shouldn't he? I mean, he's got a house full of mice. He's on <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> This is a major summit. President Biden decided this is important after watching a Tom Cruise film. Sunak and the current Conservative government are not conservative. Why don't you leave that party and come to one that actually shares uh, your ideology? This has been a party political broadcast uh, on behalf no, of I the don't. Reform UK party. Hi, I'm Ofcom. Just, just... Kids think all they have to do is take pictures of everything. Just shut down TikTok. Problem solved. This is really unfair. What's, what, what's unfair? If it's on camera, we're not doing the interview. Yes, I'm going to do. I'm going going to, you're going to resign? Yes, because I cannot continue my work. When I say I am God, I'm not joking. Did you feel Elvis was controlling? I've been answering your question, you answer mine. It's actually not my job to answer your questions. Just Are you prepared you. to call is Hamas a have, terror group? Is it possible to have a rational you can't, discussion can't, can you? I've asked you two questions. Should Hamas stay in power and are they a terror group? You're refusing to answer either of them. They that won't. is very telling. Talk TV, it's the only place where you get the truth. You've done a book on poetry. Poetry and music for the many. I love poetry, we can agree on that. On TV, on radio, and on your smartphone, this is Talk TV. This is Talk Today with David Ball and Rosie Wright. A very good morning to you. It is 8 o'clock on Friday the 5th of January. You are with Talk Today on TV, radio, online and on your smart speaker. Our top stories this morning. A war of words, the Prime Minister hints at an election later in the year as Starmer accuses Sunak of squatting in number 10. Sunken Britain, more flooding across England as Nottinghamshire declares a major incident. And the Blade Runner is freed. Oscar Pistorius has been released from prison this morning, 11 years after murdering girlfriend Reva Steenkamp. Well, after another deluge, we now have over 300 flood warnings in force. The outlook, thankfully, is for much drier weather for all of us, but it will turn colder. Well, thank goodness for that drier weather. That's what everyone wants to hear. Honestly, how much rain have we had? Because we're into early January and we're already seeing, what, monthly rainfalls for January? No, it's been absolutely awful. I mean, we've had a really wet uh, December for some areas. You know, parts of eastern Scotland and the Midlands had more than double their rain. So uh, it was their monthly average. So uh, the first few days of this month, yes, bad, but we'll see what's going on in a bit. <laughs> yeah, and hundreds of people this morning in that flooded homes. Yeah. More on that to come. First, though, should we get the headlines with Emily? Good morning. Oscar Pistorius, the former Paralympian runner, has been freed from jail 11 years after shooting dead his girlfriend, Reva Steenkamp. South African officials say he's at home under strict parole conditions, including no drinking and anger management sessions. 
Around 300 flood warnings are still in place across parts of the UK as Storm Hank brought more heavy rain overnight. A major incident's been declared in Nottinghamshire with hundreds of homes evacuated after the River Trent burst its banks. And trains in the southwest are also facing severe delays. The health secretary says the NHS can't be switched on and off during strikes as junior doctors in England continue the longest industrial action in their history. We're heading into day three of a six-day walkout. Victoria Atkins warns it's impacting patients and other workers. I'm very conscious that some of our clinicians will be having to pick up the slack that is being left because uh, some in the junior doctors committee have chosen to strike. These strikes are very, very serious for our NHS. Um, th th this is not, you know, th they should not be calling strikes, particularly as we were in the middle of negotiations. A U.S. court's unsealed a second batch of documents relating to the convicted paedophile Jeffrey Epstein. They contain more references to the Duke of York and claims that former U.S. President Bill Clinton threatened the magazine Vanity Fair not to publish articles about Epstein. And the British actress who played the suffragette mum Mrs. Banks in Mary Poppins has died at the age of 100. Glynis Johns passed away yesterday in Los Angeles from what her manager described as natural causes. Those are the headlines. I'll have another update in half an hour. Emily, thank you so much. Talking of the weather, should we get an mm, update? Isabel? Why not, Isabel? Yeah, and if you're worried about flooding, look at the Environment Agency website. They've got all the flood warnings there. There's 304 at the moment. It's um, The flooding continues to be a problem for the next few days, actually, even though the weather dries up, because, of course, we've got all that wet weather to filter through the river system. So still the number of flood warnings increasing. But let's take a look at what's going to be falling from the sky over the next few days. Times Radio sponsors Talk TV Weather. Yesterday was wet. 30 to 40 millimetres of rain across southern and southeast England. Awful on the roads as well. That low pulling away. That just leaves us with this trailing front from eastern Scotland and across parts of northern and central England. Not amounting to much, but it does look as though it will eventually decay as high pressure builds in through the weekend, settling things down. Colder air over us with some frost and fog and a chilly east wind for southern parts of the country, which sets in on Sunday. Definitely a bite to that easterly. And temperatures really struggling as well for many areas. Out there today, while well, the low pulling away with the rain gradually easing from East Anglia, this is the zone of damp and dreary weather that I think will pep up at times for eastern Scotland, trailing down into parts of northeast England. Away from that, it will be brighter, but there will be showers. Showers scattered across the coast of uh, Northern Ireland and running down from the Irish Sea into parts of Wales and southwest England too. But sunshine here in between the showers. It's further east where I think you'll hold on to mostly cloudy skies. And as I said, there will be some rain at times still across these more central areas with temperatures only six or seven Celsius. Now through this evening and tonight, where it's clearer in the west, there'll be a higher chance of seeing some frost than last night but in this zone of cloud across central and eastern areas temperatures will hold up above freezing the rain probably not amounting to more than a millimetre or two but obviously still raining from Newcastle right down through parts of the East Midlands and central southern England little bits of rain and drizzle on that and cloud for East Anglia as well so temperatures a little bit of frost in the west three or four in eastern areas and if you're out and about tomorrow it will start to feel a little bit chillier but at least there'll be some sunshine around particularly across more northern and western areas and there'll be fewer showers as well so a much better prospect after a chilly start temperatures only climbing to about five in glasgow and aberdeen but a brighter day all in all northern ireland looks good as well wales and western england just a few coastal showers but sunshine in land it's elsewhere there'll be more cloud around a little bit of rain but i think maybe a few brighter spells developing through the day and temperatures lower tomorrow than today Times Radio sponsors Talk TV Weather. Thank you very much indeed, Isabel. Now, Rishi Sunak has announced he is planning a general election in the second half of this year. Now, it was thought Sunak could call an election in May, but this has been pretty much ruled out as the Prime Minister looks, well, he's trying to gain some popularity before an election in the second half of this year. Well, quite. Well, joining us now is the Times columnist Hugo Rifkin. Uh, Hugo, really interesting this, just in terms of the timing. Rishi Sunak very much on the front foot, it seems here. His working assumption 
is, the, is the, exactly the words he used. Giving himself some space, I think, here. He doesn't want to be boxed in. But at the same time, when you look at those five pledges, he's only got one of those fulfilled. So a 20%, that is a you if I was marking his homework. Mm -hmm. He's hoping things will improve before he calls that election. Yes, it, on one level it's a gamble, on another level it's not much of a gamble because he hasn't got much to lose because he's lost it already. Uh, I mean, he's, uh, you can see where he's coming from. A government is elected for five years, he's only been in for four. He, you know, he could push it till next January if he wanted, although, uh, God forbid, uh, that would be, that'd be a, a, a bit much. But, um, I mean, look, it's often pointed out when you take an opinion poll during a parliament, what people are basically doing is they're offering a referendum on the governing party. When you, have a, when you have a general election, it's more like a referendum on when people want to be governed by... whether people want to be governed by the opposition. There's a different question being answered there. So he'll be hoping that, as we get closer to the election, people just kind of sort of go off the idea of Keir Starmer a little bit. Mm. It's possible. Who knows? We've got a lot to learn about Keir Starmer and the Labour Party and what kind of pitch they're offering to the public. Yeah. Yesterday, Keir Starmer was a little bit scuppered by Rishi Sunak making that announcement because that was his New Year's speech to sort of say, look, this is my plan. What did we really learn about Keir Starmer's vision? Well, I mean, I think, I think we're often sort of both a bit unfair and too fair to Keir Starmer. We actually do know quite a lot about mm -hmm. him. We know that his politics are very much centre-left. We know that he spent a long time as a member of Jeremy Corbyn's shadow cabinet. Uh, we know that he would uh, move Britain to the left in various ways, but he's also uh, a very sort of calm, sober, responsible individual. We, like, and, and Labour has sort of, uh, you know, discussed quite a lot of the policies that they would have um, in, if they were in government. But it suits him to almost pose as this, uh, as this slightly unknowable person because there's, there's less to attack him on. But, but in terms of uh, setting out policy detail, yeah. I, I'm still really unclear what Labour stands for. Now, maybe that's d deliberate because the Labour yep. Party doesn't want you to know at the moment because the poll lead is, is so convincing. When you listen to exactly what he said yesterday, he talked about these nebulous concepts of Project Hope, downtrodden UK, a decade of national yep. renewal. What does that mean? Well, I mean, in immediate policy terms, I mean, I heard uh, Jonathan Ashworth this morning pointing out that there could be one or perhaps even two budgets or autumn statements, fiscal events, before the next election. So they obviously can't, you know, push too much policy into it. But, um, I mean, what it means in sort of big picture terms, mm. I think, is something closer to what Joe Biden's done in America, you know, where you, uh, where you do have more investment, uh, a lot of it focused on growing the green economy, growing the future economy, uh, and, um, and, and a more sort of nebulous policy of reversing mm. Tory chaos. I think what's sort of interesting, though, what Rishi Sunak will be counting on a little bit. About a year ago, the Conservatives were beginning to look like the party that had broken the country after the sort of disastrous Liz Truss regime and all that sort of thing. Where we are now, something has changed a little bit in that the country doesn't look that much better, but that's kind of background noise. That's a given. And now people are starting to ask which party do they think is going to be better at fixing the country or at least mm. preventing further decline. That probably still works to Labour's advantage, but not quite as much. Yeah, because the thing is, Keir Starmer right now is kind of playing on heartstrings rather than anything else. He's saying, look, get mm. rid of despair, yep. come to us for hope. <laughs> yeah. And, you know, as journalists, we get really stuck into kind of the nitty-gritty of the policy. But does that really play with the public? Maybe they're just thinking, I am fed up and just want to change. Yeah, totally. I mean, what the Tories are really hoping for is that one Labour policy that they can stick the knife in and, and go, this will hurt you, this is why mm. you don't want him, this is why these people are scary. And so what Labour is desperate not to do is to give that policy. They want a vibe election. They, so, want to, they want to cruise yeah, in the yeah, so, right, so, yeah. so, obviously, there are obstacles in the way. Wellingborough by-election mm -hmm. coming up next, I believe. So, so, this is Peter Bone. He was forced to step down. He had a very convincing majority, I think 16,000 yep. or thereabouts. Now, obviously, Labour must feel quite confident there, but not natural territory. You've also got Reform UK polling at 11%. Ben Habib, co-deputy leader, standing there as well. What, what is the Labour Party hoping to do there? Win, I assume? Uh, I mean, I, to be honest, I'm, in that particular by-election, I'm not sure. They've had a good run of by-elections. But I think almost less important for the Labour Party... I don't think people really notice who wins by-elections. People notice that there are by-elections. Yeah. So a bigger deal for Rishi Sunak, it's not so much whether he loses this by-election, it's whether by this time, by autumn, there have been another three or four Conservatives who've stepped down in various mm. disastrous... Sort or of, disgrace, or yeah, whatever it might be. Whatever, whatever disgrace, whatever scandal, yeah. A, a big thing that's different from this time last year is what's happened in Scotland, mm -hmm. because the Labour Party, I think, now can look at what's happened with the SNP and think, ah, we can secure seats there, potentially, they wouldn't have dreamed of. Yeah. De I mean, that's definitely true. There, I mean, S Scotland's been very odd politically for a few years, quite a long time now, since mm -hmm. the referendum, really, where you've effectively had uh, 
nationalist votes and unionist votes. And you've had a lot of Conservative and Labour voters lending the other party their votes in order to vote against the SNP. And you've also had that whole swathe of kind of left-wing Scotland, particularly on the West Coast, that was once a uh, sort of surefire Labour, has, has switched to the SNP. A lot of that will be have begun to dissolve. Quite wobbly, yeah. So they, I mean, uh, Labour can almost certainly mm. count on at least 15 to 20 seats in Scotland and maybe far more. And, and Scotland may well be... I suppose, pivotal in who wins that election. Just moving on to the headlines this morning. Rishi Sunak now pledging tax cuts. We have the highest uh, tax burden in 70 years currently. Yeah. So now the Conservative Party deciding that they need to be Conservative to win the election. Equally, you've now got Starmer saying no cuts for two years under Starmer. That is a clear dividing line. It's a clear dividing line, but it's also a phony war because, I mean, it, it sort of shows the futility of government at the moment. Taxes aren't really the big deal. The thing that's really, really hitting people's pockets is inflation, is rising costs, rising mortgage costs, uh, rising rents, all this kind of stuff. Uh, when, when Rishi Sunak talks about tax cuts, he's talking about saving, I think, what is it, what, normal families, it's between, between four and six hundred pounds a year, isn't Indeed, it? Indeed, yeah. I mean, relative to a lot of people's increased mortgage payments, that's nothing. And also, uh, as, I mean, Labour's attack this morning, pointing out that maybe, despite the tax cuts, we'll still be paying more because of fiscal... Well, and also, he's, he's hoping that as we'll see interest rates coming down, that people will actually feel the money in their pocket because their mortgages will be cheaper. But that's what they're hoping, isn't yeah, it? Yeah, that doesn't quite follow because as interest rates come down, all that means is that people's mortgages are going to go up by less. By less. Yeah. By less. <laughs> but they're still going to go up. Yeah. <laughs> they certainly are all to play for, as they quite. say, Hugo. Thank you very much indeed. Now, moving on now, the UK has been battered by severe weather and heavy rainfall in recent months, with many finding their homes and their businesses very seriously damaged or destroyed by flood water. Well, we can speak now to Andy Goodall, whose pub, The Rose and Crown in Sevenstoke, in Wiltshire, has been flooded three times in 12 months. Andy, thank you so much for talking to us. Just, you know, set the scene for us. What happened this time round? Um, well, good morning, uh, Rosie. Good morning, David. Um, the water levels uh, just came in so quick this time. Within a couple of hours, um, the water's travelled uh, from the River Seven, probably about three quarters of a mile from down the lane. Um, and within two hours, it, it's hit the front door. Um, fortunately for us, we actually already put our defences up in October the 22nd. Um, so we didn't have an awful lot to do. It was just mainly locking up the front door, as you can see on the video there, uh, and putting the pumps uh, into action. I just feel so sorry for you. And, and it just feels so relentless. I was flooded myself, not to that extent, but, it, but you, you feel a real sense of desperation and decimation, don't you? Yeah, it's it's really, really tough um, for us. I mean, we're only a small community here in Sevenstoke. Um, it, it is good. We have got a great community spirit and we, we're all making sure everybody's OK. We're keeping in touch with each other. We've got a little WhatsApp group going on. Um, but yeah, we're just getting a little bit fed up with it now. Uh, I mean, we're being promised um, from the uh, environmental agency that this scheme would have been finished at Christmas um, 2023. And we've not even started it yet. They've moved a bit of soil, uh, getting ready for the buns. But it's, it's just a long way off mm. the whole scheme. Because sadly, Andy, you know, your recovery from flooding is becoming a bit of a well-oiled machine. Well, yeah, it, I mean, we've we become more flood resistant. Um, I'm never going to stop the water getting into the property. No. We know that. Um, but uh, by doing the membrane on the outside, uh, the damp proof membrane, we wrap the whole pub um, and then we sandbag it. Uh, because it's a 500 year old building, you know, timber frame, so there's a, you're going to spring a lot of leaks everywhere. Um, but, yeah. And, and, ju and just in terms of grants that are available, how easy is it to access government money to recoup your losses, for example, to replace furniture, to provide damp proofing or whatever you need to do, flood defences and so on, and lost trade? Yeah, um, there's nothing there. In, in 2021, uh, when we flooded then, uh, I mean, COVID was on then, so there was... Uh, we did get some support from the government, um, but we've had nothing since. Um, there is a flood recovery grant, uh, which I found out about yesterday for the last storm we had. Um, it's approximately £2,500. Um, but that £2,500 doesn't pay for the skip, the damp-proof membrane. And, you know, I mean, they support us with the sandbags, uh, which is great. Um, but loss of trades, so you're probably losing £20,000 a week. Uh, the amount of food I've lost, uh, mm. you know, it just adds up. 
uh, especially at this time of the year, going into January, the quieter season. Um, you know, I've got staff with mortgages and rent to pay. Mm. Uh, and it's a worry. It's a worry on how we're going to, uh, you know, support these people. Yeah, of course. Of course. Well, I mean, it's been amazing to see how you've kind of just taken this all in, in pretty good faith, really. I mean, looking at those videos of you smiling throughout this, mm. I guess, what questions are you asking about how financially viable it is for your business to stay open if this keeps happening? Um, I mean, the Rose and Crown, Sevenstoke, we won uh, Great Marston's Great British Pub of the Year this year. Um, we've been extremely busy, and that's what keeps us going. Mm. Um, you know, the fact that we know that in the spring things will pick up, we'll have a busy summer, mm. uh, the staff are absolutely wonderful in, 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 you know, in the work that they carry out for us. Um, but it just keeps you going because you know, you're, as a local employer, um, these people need jobs, especially you know, in the current crisis that we're in. And it's great to hear your pub is doing so well. There are many establishments around the country that aren't doing as well. We're seeing record numbers of pubs closing on a weekly basis, the fabric of Britain, I think, being ripped away. What advice would you give to other landlords? It's, it's, it's hard work. I mean, we're currently trying to book the trend and we're trying to go the other way. Um, my business partner runs the King's Head in Worcester um, and we've just taken over another pub uh, the Cocking Magpie at Beaudley, uh, which is also next to the river. So there seems to be a oh. bit of a theme going on here. We like water. Um, but, um, yeah, you've got to get stuck in to the hard work, the graft, and, and set the business up. I mean, the Rose and Crown has a great business module. Um, and if we can pick this up and move it to these other pubs, mm -hmm. and then, fingers crossed, uh, we're employing more local people, um, and, and we're going to try and help them through this hardship. Well, we raise a glass to you, Andy. Thank you so much for talking to us and best of luck with the, for the third time uh, this year at uh, the cleanup operations. Thank you so much for giving us a bit of an insight into what you're battling with. There is lots to come here on Talk Today. GPs are feeling the pressure as they deliver an extra 4 million checkups a month. And we're going to introduce you to one Labradoodle who enjoyed a $4,000 meal. Yum. Author Nikki Hodgson and Spike Fraser Myers are back for a final look through this morning's papers. Do stay with us. The time is 8.18. Thanks for joining us. You're with Talk TV on TV, on radio, online. We're on your smart speaker as well. Criminals using XL bully dogs as weapons to threaten others. No matter how well trained, most dog owners will tell you a dog can turn. Do you know what I love about Talk Today? We do it all. Sunak, Suella, scones. I rather like David Cameron. I don't sort of bear him any ill will because he delivered the referendum that he said he would deliver. The Tories love a scrap. You can almost see this coming round the tracks with Suella Braverman. She's heading up one side and Rishi soon at the other. The police are pro-Palestine. That is just not right. You swear an oath in the police to act without fear or favour. The Covid inquiry seems to have turned into a sort of pantomime. There's not really any substance to it. It's hard to know whether it's a farce or a tragedy. For the amount of time it's taken, the number of illegal migrants currently sent by us to Rwanda is zilch. The amount of money it's cost, we're saying, what are we saying it's cost? About 140 million. 140 million pounds so far. So 140 million pounds so far result nil, absolutely nil. Are we only going to be trusting sources like Meta and Google? Where is our unbiased news going to come from? Calais in winter is cold. <laughs> <laughs> that is from the Jeremy Corbyn book. Kevin O'Sullivan is the worst presenter on Talk TV. Sitting on his fat ass <laughs> talking for a living. If you're walking towards me and you're a vegan, you have a great big orange sticker over here saying, watch out, vegans about. The weirdest plank that we've had in, what, yeah. three years? Hundreds and hundreds of mice in a box, which he walks into a branch of McDonald's. McMouse Man. McMouse Man, yeah. McMouse Man. He should be easy enough to catch this guy, shouldn't he? I mean, he's got a house full of mice. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> This is a major summit. President Biden decided this was important after watching a Tom Cruise film. Sunak and the current Conservative government are not conservative. Why don't you leave that party and come to one that actually shares uh, your ideology? This has been a party political broadcast uh, on behalf no, of I the don't. Reform UK party. Hi, I'm Ofcom. Just, just... Kids think all they have to do is take pictures of everything. Just shut down TikTok. Problem solved. 
This is really unfair. What's, what, what's unfair? If it's on camera, we're not doing the interview. So yes, I'm going to do. I'm I'm going to, you're going to resign? Yes, because I cannot continue my work. When I say I am God, I'm not joking. Did you feel Elvis was controlling? I've been answering your question, you answer mine. It's actually not my job to answer your questions. Are you prepared you. to call is Hamas a terror group? Is it possible to have a rational you can't, can you? Use? I've asked you two questions. Should Hamas stay in power and are they a terror group? You're refusing to answer either of them. They that won't. is very telling. Talk TV, it's the only place where you get the truth. You've done a book on poetry. Poetry and music for the many. I love poetry, we can agree on that. Welcome back to Talk Today. The time is 8.21. We'll have the papers for you in just a moment, but here's what else is coming up in the programme. Oh, it's more documents relating to the disgrace financier Jeffrey Epstein are released. We'll bring you the latest analysis in about 10 minutes' time. Disgraced Paralympian Oscar Pistorius have been released from prison this morning. That's 11 years after he shot dead his girlfriend, Reva Steenkamp. We'll speak to her mother's spokesperson at quarter to nine. And Keir Starmer has accused Rishi Sunak of squatting in Downing Street after nine. We'll ask Spectator Deputy Editor Freddie Gray when exactly we should expect that general election. Well, let's now take a final look at some of this morning's front pages. The Times is leading with the Health Secretary's message to striking doctors who are told the NHS belongs to all of us, not just you. No way back, says the Mail, as the paper claims Prince Andrew will never return to the royal fold after the release of the Epstein files. And in the sun, time to give Andrew the chop as pressure mounts on King Charles to punish his brother after more lurid allegations. Author and journalist Nikki Hodgson and Spike Deputy Editor Fraser Myers are here for a final look through uh, this morning's papers. Uh, Nikki, let's move on to this story in the mirror. This is page two of the mirror. Mm. Um, this is about the NHS. When I read this story, I didn't quite believe it. Tell us more. No, and neither did I. So the headline is, weekly GP checkups rise 30% since 2019, which sounds like... say that like, again. Say that. So weekly GP yeah. checkups rise 30% since 2019. So that gives the impression that everybody's been seen by the GP more. <laughs> but actually, what it's saying is that... OK, so it acknowledges that there were 31.4 million appointments held in November which is a record for the month, and that's the 30% increase. But the checkups are only being done by four in 10 doctors. Six in 10 are done by other medical staff at the right. practice. So it's basically the story is hidden in the middle of this little piece. And it's just telling us what we already know, that GPs have far too many patients. Some of them are ghost patients. There was a story the other week coming out there about was. how mm. they're paid to keep patients on their books and they don't know how many are active. But it says here that each GP in England has 2,290 patients to, to serve. It's obviously ridiculous. Obviously, you can't get through that many people. You can't help them. So anyway, it's just, it's just the headline is very misleading on this piece. It, the, the, the reality is it is still very difficult to get a, uh, an appointment with your GP. Yes, and of course, they're paid on a capitation basis, which means actually GPs are paid according to the number of patients they have, not the number they actually see. Yeah. That model is broken. It seems the whole NHS model is broken. Yeah, it seems that way. And, you know, we have um, a much lower sort of number of doctors in general per capita than the rest of Europe. That is a clear sort of long-term structural problem that needs to be fixed if we're going to get people seen. You know, the NHS waiting list is just unbelievable at the moment. Is you know, it's still in the millions. I think sometimes we don't stand up enough for our, for our GPs. I've been seen and treated by the GP uh, brilliantly online in the last six months. Do you two have personal experience of not being able to get a GP appointment? Yes, terrible. I've been waiting six months for a blood test result. Mm. <laughs> for a result? Yes which has been a result that has been read wrong somewhere along the line and the test needs redoing. Oh. I have one of the GPs where you have to ring up at 8am in the yeah, morning well. or you don't get And yet the government pledges that will stop. Yeah. They keep yeah. saying that it's is going to stop. It's a terrible system to dial at 8am. It, really we're all on TV at 8am, so we can't do it. Well, you used to do it online and then they've shifted to this yeah. system because obviously that clears out a lot of the you know people getting yeah. through. But yeah. there again, lots of people can't be online. For mm. example, older yeah. people may not be able to be online yeah. as well. So Could we be. need to ensure quality of access. But actually, going back to your point, we only have 123,000 doctors in this country. We need more doctors. Clearly. We've got a, a sort of good news story-ish. Mm. Fraser, at page nine of the eye, banks to reduce mortgage rates to under 4%. I think lots of us think this is actually pretty amazing that they've managed to get, I think it's the average two-year fixed rate is now below 4%. Um, that is brilliant news compared to where the last six, seven months has looked. Yeah. 
but still not really good news if the last seven months hadn't happened at all. That's that's true. I mean, people have still suffered and lost their money. You know, they're not getting that back. But it, they could come down further as well. They're suggesting the next couple of months we could see uh, some rates right, uh, fall to 3%. Now, I think this is interesting because this plays into the election that is coming up. And one of the big things that um, has, you know, led to the sort of collapse of the Tory uh, vote share is high mortgage rates. People, if you cast your mind back to um, 2022, just at the time that Boris Johnson was leaving, he was only six behind, uh, six points behind in, in the polls to mm. Labour. Um, and really, it was the sort of mortgage bombshell, I think, was one of the huge factors that um, has made people disregard the Conservatives. Now, could that be a factor potentially going into the next election? Lower inflation, maybe the Bank of England starts to lower the base rate of interest as well. People start to see that feed through their mortgages. It's a possibility. The Tories are so far behind, but it's worth thinking about. It's and worth and I think that's a mind. brilliant point, which is actually most people don't think about politics all the time, all day, every day. And actually what they look at is their bank balance. Can they afford their mortgage? And we kept seeing the Bank of interest, uh, England putting up interest rates, yeah. subsequent interest rate rises. Of course, now inflation has come down, although mm. Rishi Sunak says it's down to him. If interest rates do come down, I think people may think differently. Maybe they will, but we've got to remember as well, we've got thousands of people who are still kind of facing repossessions of their homes. In, in particular, single parent families are really facing homelessness, you know, really vast increase, hundreds of thousands. Mm. So, you know, there's still a lot of people that have been very affected by what's already happened, even if it changes for the better. Nikki, uh, let's move on to a page, uh, page three of the mail. I'm obsessed by this. <laughs> Men who wash their towels just once a year. <laughs> This is just really hilarious, actually. So apparently, um, yeah, about 10% of men wash their towels once a year or less. No. And, uh, Should we ask the men well, currently with we us, please, Survey? I don't think anyone's going to admit that this. Is, that's grotesque. Okay. I, can't, yes. <laughs> I can't condone that kind of behaviour. I, I frequently change my towels, let me tell you, at least <laughs> twice a week. Yes, and I've got to be honest, I'm terrible at housework, but my husband washes everything and does everything very well, <laughs> so <laughs> he, he's not in that statistic. <laughs> but it's tied to a story about divorce rates, actually, because uh, there's also a story in the mail about saying that uh, men are becoming better husbands because there are, women are filing for fewer divorces. It's a load of rubbish. It's all to do with the cost of living crisis. People can't afford to get divorced anymore. It's my, it's my take on it. Or possibly put the washing on. Either. Yeah, they can't absolutely. afford the washing machine. So do we think divorce rates are actually down? Divorce rates are down. They are down since the 90s. But it is because of fewer people getting married and also people... Uh, some people sticking it out, but it's actually mainly now to do with the cost of living crisis. 270,000 divorces are currently on hold because people can't afford to push them through. Wow. Yeah. They, have yeah. they have made it easier to get a divorce as They well. have made it easier with um, the reforms last year, but it's still minimum of £900 just to do the paperwork. Think about getting married. The base paperwork is £150, so they obviously mm. make it harder to get out of it than to get into it. I think marriage. also, Fraser, it's just the reality of facing, if you're sharing your yeah. mortgage, yeah. your bills yeah. with someone else, to think, absolutely. oh, my <laughs> gosh, how am I going to do this alone? No, yeah. I, th I think that's absolutely right. It, yeah, the cost is, is a huge factor. But, I mean, you know, there is a bigger cultural point. You know, people do get married voluntarily now. I mean, not that people were forced into it before, <laughs> but, you know, there's yeah. not the same pressure. Yeah. You only get married to someone you love, you don't... You know, they're, they're far fewer people get married. People stay in relationships much longer before they get married, much more tried and tested. So it kind of makes sense that the marriages that do happen last longer. Uh, let's move on to the Daily Star now. This is a, a headline, <laughs> Fake Vlad Blow. <laughs> So, uh, Vladimir Putin's alleged uh, body double, it's not, yeah, been, uh, it's not been confirmed that he is. I should say that if people are seeing the picture, a lot of that is due to makeup. He doesn't really look that much <laughs> like Vladimir Putin in real life. But he is um, a carpenter uh, from Georgia. Uh, Vladimir... Uh, I've actually forgotten his name now. I forgot how to pronounce it. Um, but essentially, he's been allegedly poisoned. Um, this is Yegevny Vasilevich. That's it. There you go. Yes. There you go. Yegevny Vasilevich. Um, he's allegedly been poisoned, come out in a rash, um, potentially in uh, an assassination attempt. Now, what's interesting, this news is... The source of the news is a little bit dubious. The same... <laughs> the same... Uh, <laughs> the same, the same uh, sort of uh, telegram channel that has been put out yeah. in this story has also claimed that Putin himself is already dead. Um, oh, and right. oh. we're seeing a body That'll double uh, on screen. So we're already seeing a body so we're, double. We're, 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 so 
make, you know, how many more than doubles, body triples, quadruples? So yes. there are three, they were three. three. There's presumably, there are, three of them. presumably yeah. there are many of them running around as a sort of decoy <laughs> in yeah. case someone's trying to assassinate wow. people. There must wow. be a stockpile of them, I there must be. <laughs> <laughs> Need a few, um, obviously. Should we move to the mirror, Nikki? Mm. Stamp right now rather than stop right now. Uh, I actually oh, love very that. good. <laughs> Should we have a look? Yeah, so it's about uh, these commemorative stamps that are being uh, issued by the Royal Mail. Uh, 15 stamps to mark the Spice Girls' 30th anniversary. Oh, my goodness, am I that old? <laughs> 30 years yes. ago. <laughs> yes, you are. <laughs> uh, but they're, they're all quite fetching. Yeah. Apart from this personal stamp of sporty spice, Melanie's very beautiful in real life. I met her in a club in Ibiza once, and she's absolutely gorgeous. And um, she doesn't look anything like that, so I'd be quite offended if I was Melanie C. These are quite good, the ones we're looking at now, Those, baby. The, the performing ones are good, Gosh. yeah. They're nice. Excellent. Um, yeah. <laughs> but will people collect them? Or are buy are them? they British treasures? Do they warrant being on stamps? I think, I think they're so. one of the biggest, <laughs> the biggest girl, <laughs> name a bigger girl band, really. Well, they are a British uh, export, for better or worse, so. Well, I think they're better. <laughs> Fraser, will you be rushing out to have a whole set? Oh, yeah, absolutely, straight away. I know, I think they've they've earned their place, haven't they, in the, in the <laughs> British, in, in British the, British in culture, canon. definitely, in yeah. the echelon. Sure. I think, imagine, remember how excited everyone was when they performed at the Olympics? I mean, just <laughs> yeah. people went crazy for Oh, it. the Spice Girls define my childhood. I absolutely loved them. <laughs> Very much so. <laughs> and let's move on now, Fraser, to The Guardian. It, this is online. Uh, Cecil has been a very naughty golden doodle. Hasn't <laughs> very, very naughty. Very dog, naughty. A, a dog in uh, Pittsburgh, uh, Pennsylvania, has swallowed four thousand dollars in cash. <laughs> There's the culprit <laughs> looking very guilty. Uh, about yeah. it. Oh gosh, how? Straight to the vet. Um, that's around <laughs> three thousand. Video actually. Should we see what oh. happened? This right. is Cecil. He's never done anything wrong in his life. I mean, he looks incredibly <laughs> guilty. Cecil. In the, in the pictures, um, he looks so yeah. guilty. Oh, he was fine, but he had to. Do oh no, yeah, we know what no. happened. There. No, so they had to. So the, the, oh. I mean, the, it's a little bit <laughs> gross. Oh, no. They did. They had to wade through the dog's uh, vomit and stuff, but they did recover actually most of the money. There's only about four hundred and fifty dollars that they couldn't recover and piece back together. So very determined. So for people obviously listening on the radio, we were seeing seeing some quite graphic details. Yes, yeah, some of quite of graphic. Dog. Yeah. But just who hangs four four thousand dollars hanging around <laughs> that Cecil can eat? Well, I think they might have a visit from the tax man. <laughs> <laughs> and and, and, and maybe a size. cleaner as yeah. well. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. Grim. I mean, have any pets done anything as bad as that? Well, my sausage dog ate the prized Christmas decoration yesterday off the tree when oh, I was putting the decks and away. And what was it? Uh, it was like this lovely felt donkey. <laughs> you just thought it was a toy, oh. ripped its head off, had a great time, and then got into trouble later okay, on. That didn't cost four thousand dollars. It didn't. No, it took <laughs> no, it a bit no. cheaper. Sentimental value alone. Poor donkey. <laughs> um, Nikki Fraser, thank you both so much for coming in this morning. It's been such a pleasure to have you. Yes, it certainly has. Now, though, it's time for a quick news update with Emily. Good morning. The former Paralympian runner Oscar Pistorius is at home after being freed from jail. He was found guilty of murdering his girlfriend Reva Steenkamp in 2013. South African officials say he'll be under strict parole conditions, including no drinking and anger management sessions. Labour's accused Rishi Sunak of squatting in Downing Street after he suggested the general election will be held in the second half of the year. There's been speculation over whether he'd call a vote in May alongside local elections. But the Prime Minister says more time's needed to let tax cuts take effect. Jonathan Haslam is a former Downing Street communications director. We're left with this delicious idea now of what is the timing for the election? Because it does get a little bit confusing later on in the year. You have party conference season in September. And uh, I just wonder, maybe uh, he would want to go, Sunak, on October the 19th, which is just two days and five years after Boris Johnson uh, went to the country. And house prices bounced back last month, with the average price up £5,000 on the year before. Halifax says property values increased by 1.7%, and it's the third monthly rise in a row, making a typical home worth around £287,000. You're up to date. I'll have more headlines at 9 o'clock. Thank you very much indeed, Emily. Now you've been getting in touch uh, with all of your stories. We're talking about politics this morning, and, and uh, the fact that Keir Starmer said he would fight fire with fire... And I suppose politics has become so vitriolic. There's so much venom between all of the parties, and many of you commenting on that as well. Erin uh, says, I'm fine with venom in politics. However, you do need to remove the lies. Our country is overshadowed by sleaze scandals and competence of our politicians. We want them to work with integrity. Do you think it's, it's sort of venomous to say, I'm going to trade out despair for hope? That's kind of a, a gentle way of being critical. Yeah, I would agree. 
I would agree. But but also, you do need to back it up, don't you? You need policy, and that's the bit that yeah. I think is lacking currently. Adam, good morning. He said, I dislike Keir's policies, but I'd rather vote Labour than continue fighting for survival in broken Britain delivered by the Tories. And Cameron said, if we uh, take out the venom from politics, it would be mostly silence. Oh. <laughs> that's very disappointing. Right, that's oh, disturbing. and then on uh, dry January, uh, to uh, to Tomos, uh, Tomos says, uh, pubs are struggling because we are all struggling. It isn't cheap anymore to go out for a pint. I second that. It's not. Yeah. Uh, keep your views coming in. You can text us, talk, and your message to 8722. Right now, though, at 8.36, let's check in with Isabel on the weather. I know we talk about, like, it's expensive, so you don't really want to go into a pub, say, but you want to get out and just have a walk, and we haven't really had that opportunity. <laughs> yes. You know, that's what I can't wait, to just not be splashing in puddles and covered in mud when I'm running. And hopefully, high pressure will bring us that good news. Times Radio sponsors Talk TV Weather. Well, even though the weather is looking drier, there'll still be some flooding issues. That rain's still filtering through the river systems. We had a lot of rain yesterday from this low. That's pulling away. There will be some rain from this frontal system draped across small central parts of the country, but that'll tend to fizzle out through the weekend as high pressure develops and takes control of our weather. It will become colder, definitely daytime temperatures struggling to maybe four or five degrees. And there'll be a cold easterly wind across southern parts of the country in particular. So a real chill in the air from Sunday onwards. Well, luckily, the rain now starting to clear away from eastern areas after a really wet 12 hours. This is the area of rain that we'll be watching, uh, sort of through the spine of the country and up into eastern Scotland, where it could well pep up for Aberdeenshire for a while. Elsewhere, the showers, well, coming and going a bit this morning, but they will tend to fade through the afternoon, giving some sunnier weather for western Scotland and northern Ireland to end the day. And western parts of England and Wales still seeing some showers, but a little bit of brightness in between, whereas for the Midlands and eastern areas, it stays rather grey and bits and pieces of rain still hanging on and temperatures will be a little bit lower than yesterday. Now, as we head through this evening tonight, we've still got that rain. It tends to peter out in eastern Scotland, but maybe from, say, Newcastle down through the Midlands into central southern England, there'll still be a little bit of rain on that uh, weak weather system. To the east, a few showers coming into Norfolk, and to the west, one or two coastal showers, but a lot of dry, clear weather to the west, and obviously temperatures then tumbling with some frost in places and a little bit of fog as well. And if you're out and about this weekend, it becomes dry. There will be some sunshine around, but watch out for more frost and fog. Times Radio sponsors Talk TV Weather. Thank you very much indeed, Isabel. Now another batch of documents related to disgraced financier Jeffrey Epstein have been released, amounting to an extra 300 pages of material. Well, yesterday, Prince Andrew and Bill Clinton were among high-profile figures named in the US court papers. But what does it mean? We're joined now by the royal correspondent Jenny Bond. Jenny, very good morning to you. Um, the dust has settled a little bit, specifically regarding the sort of revelations about Prince Andrew. What do we know? Well, we don't know that much new in terms of fresh allegations, but we know a lot more detail about the allegations that have been knocking around now for years and years. Um, these unsealed documents relate to a court case brought by Virginia Jaffray, to whom, you might remember, uh, Prince Andrew paid out a certain amount of money, don't know quite how much, but millions of pounds, to settle a case out of court. Um, and it's details from a case she brought um, some years ago uh, that have now been unsealed. So we know that it's full of sleaze, if you like, and it's not just Prince Andrew, there's a lot of other big names, as you've probably seen there, President Clinton, um, other uh, extremely important people who were associated with Epstein. For Andrew, it is a, an eternal embarrassment and shame. For the royal family, it is another morning of opening the newspapers. You can only feel sympathy, I think, for, for King Charles, opening the papers and think, oh, my God, you know, this time last year, um, I had Harry all over the papers with his book, and now it's my brother. Um, really shaming the royal family, because I don't think people abroad really know the difference between a working royal and a non-working royal. We all know, I think, that Andrew is a non-working royal because he's been sacked, essentially, by his late mother. Um, but nevertheless, the sleaze, I think, sticks to the whole of the royal family, and it must be immensely depressing.
It, it must indeed, and, and I agree with you. Buckingham Palace has been very quiet about that, saying that Prince Andrew is a non-working royal. But at the end of the day, he is the king's brother. And the king has extended the olive branch. He has allowed him back in to the family or to be seen with the family. We saw them at Christmas for example, he was desperate in some ways to, to uh, rehabilitate him into the family, also changed his mind on whether he should be thrown out of that royal residence. What does the king do from here? Well, I think he has to remain, um, remain taking a very firm line against Andrew, and there's clearly no way back whatsoever for Andrew in a public role. And I think he has been, you know, pushing at doors and thinking there might be a way back. And the coronation, you might remember, he was allowed to wear his garter robes, um, which uh, surprised me, I must say, but he wasn't allowed to go to the garter ceremony. Uh, he'll be allowed at no public functions whatsoever, but as you say, you know, he is his blood brother, and the king is actually quite a softy. He's a sentimental man. He he cares deeply. You know, he's, Charles is really all about um, love and peace and harmony. You can almost imagine him, you know, wearing flowers in his hair and smoking a joint and saying <laughs> peace and love. <laughs> It's uh, so so. I don't think he's going to banish Andrew, um, but I, you know, he must be utterly, utterly depressed, and I think mean, the, the relationship between the two of them must be pretty damn frosty. Yeah, and you just imagine the conversations they'll be having now. Look, from Prince Andrew's perspective, there was almost that sort of a hint of rehabilitation over Christmas, and now mm. so much of it comes unpicked. You know, front page of the papers. None of the royal family will want that. Prince Andrew presumably yeah. has learned from his mishandling of this when he did that Newsnight interview. How do you think he's going to navigate the next few days and weeks? Has he learned? Has he learned? Andrew isn't someone who takes to lessons very easily from all that I know of him. He's a very um, arrogant man. Um, and he's been traumatised by this, I, I'm quite sure, and very depressed by it. He's kept a very low profile, but... Uh, the rumours abound that, and reports abound that he has been knocking on doors and saying, you know, let me in, let me in, I, I want a way back. Um, he's refusing really to accept uh, just how how much disgrace um, he's in. And not just that, I mean, he's a laughing stock really, mm. after Newsnight. He became a laughing stock in the country. Um, so I don't think he's a man with a great deal of self-awareness, but um, he's going to have to face the fact that he has a lovely family, has a beautiful house, which may or may not remain his in Windsor Great Park, um, and he's just got to get on with his life quietly. Uh, and you mentioned there, it was a very strong word, actually, he's a very arrogant man. And also the pressure coming from people like William and Kate, for example, to the king saying you must distance yourself from him. Yeah, I think William has been at the forefront of this. Perhaps being a nephew isn't quite so close as being um, a brother. Um, and William certainly was uh, one of those who, a couple of years ago, when the Queen really wanted to let Andrew, the late Queen, wanted to let Andrew take part in the garter ceremony at Windsor, he said, no, absolutely not. Look, if, um, if he is allowed to uh, take part in the ceremony, I will not. He actually issued an ultimatum, we understand. Um, and uh, so I think he will be uh, absolutely standing resolute with his father and saying, no way back, and let's take a very firm line on this. You know, William tries so hard, and Charles has, to make this new era of monarchy a good one and a relatable one and an approachable and friendly and decent one. And then it all gets unpicked by these headlines. And it's not just today. I mean, the headlines have been going on for a week, and they'll probably continue. Uh, I see. It's like something that's that's stuck to his shoe, isn't it? <laughs> really, um, Andrew is never going to be able to shake off the stench of this sleaze. I think that's such a brilliant way of, of describing it. It's following. It literally is following him around. Mm. Jenny, you understand how this family operates, and also, you know, you've seen how these stories play with the public. How much do the public really care about what kind of role Prince Andrew takes on? I think they would care if they saw him standing on the balcony and, and waving and taking part, in, perhaps representing the king in places. I, th I think he is not a, a fit ambassador for this country, and that is essentially what uh, the senior members of the royal family do. They, they represent the king and they represent this country, and I don't think people would be very happy to have Andrew representing us. Mm. Jenny, thank you very much indeed uh, for your time. Still to come, almost 11 years after murdering Reva Steenkamp, Oscar Pistorius has been released from prison. We'll speak to the Steenkamp family spokesperson next. This is Talk Today. A very good morning.
Thanks for joining us. You're with Talk TV on TV, on radio, online. We're on your smart speaker as well. Criminals using XL bully dogs as weapons to threaten others. No matter how well trained, most dog owners will tell you a dog can turn. Do you know what I love about sport today? We do it all. Sunak, Suella, scones. I rather like David Cameron. I don't sort of bear him any ill will because he delivered the referendum that he said he would deliver. The Tories love a scrap. You can almost see this coming round the tracks with Suella Bravman. She's heading up one side and Rishi soon at the other. The police are pro-Palestine. That is just not right. You swear an oath in the police to act without fear or favour. The Covid inquiry seems to have turned into a sort of pantomime. There's not really any substance to it. It's hard to know whether it's a farce or a tragedy. The amount of time it's taken, the number of illegal migrants currently sent by us to Rwanda, zilt. The amount of money it's cost, we're saying, what are we saying it's cost? About 140 million. 140 million pounds so far. So 140 million pounds so far result nil, absolutely nil. Are we only going to be trusting sources like Meta and Google? Where is our unbiased news going to come from? Calais in winter is cold. <laughs> <laughs> that is from the Jeremy Corbyn book. Kevin O'Sullivan is the worst presenter on Talk TV. Sitting on his fat ass <laughs> talking for a living. If you're walking towards me and you're a vegan, you have a great big orange sticker over here saying, watch out, vegans about. The weirdest plank that we've had in, what, yeah. three years? Hundreds and hundreds of mice in a box, which he walks into a branch of McDonald's. McMouse Man. McMouse Man, yeah. McMouse Man. He should be easy enough to catch this guy, shouldn't he? I mean, he's got a house full of mice. He's on <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> This is a major summit. President Biden decided this is important after watching a Tom Cruise film. Sunak and the current Conservative government are not conservative. Why don't you leave that party and come to one that actually shares uh, your ideology? This has been a party political broadcast uh, on behalf no, of I the don't. Reform UK party. Hi, I'm just, I'm just... Kids think all they have to do is take pictures of everything. Just shut down TikTok. Problem solved. This is really unfair. What's, what, what's unfair? If it's on camera, we're not doing the interview. Yes, I'm going to do. I'm I'm going to, you're going to resign? Yes, because I cannot continue my work. When I say I am God, I'm not joking. Did you feel Elvis was controlling? I've been answering your question, you answer mine. It's actually not my job to answer your questions. Just Are you prepared you. to call is Hamas a have, terror group? Is it possible to have a rational you can't, discussion can't, can you? I've asked you two questions. Should Hamas stay in power and are they a terror group? You're refusing to answer either of them. They that won't. is very telling. Talk TV, it's the only place where you get the truth. You've done a book on poetry. Poetry and music for the many. I love poetry, we can agree on that. Welcome back to Talk Today. The time is 8.48. Shamed athlete Oscar Pistorius has left prison this morning, almost 11 years after he shot and killed his girlfriend, model Reva Steenkamp. The ex-Paralympic gold medalist has been released on parole and is now at home, according to South Africa's Correctional Services Department. Joining us now is Tanya Cohen, lawyer and spokesperson for Reva's mother, June. Tanya, thank you so much for talking to us. Now, uh, you, the family, knew this day was coming. Talk us through, from the family's perspective, what today means, because I know they've had some kind of contact with Oscar Pistorius as part of the, you know, the process for him to be released from prison. This must be, for them, a, a difficult day. On the contrary, I want to say it's not a difficult day if compared with the fact that Reva died. June and Barry have always said, they've put it into perspective and said that the worst day of their lives was the day that Reva died. So whether Oscar remains in prison or is released, they knew that day was also coming because they've always known that's what the South African justice system states, that any offender is eligible to be considered for placement on parole. And if they meet that criteria, they will be released. So it's part of my job as an attorney to to prepare them mentally, and I did that from the start. So today came as no surprise to them. Uh, Tanya, your, your sound quality, unfortunately, isn't very good. We'll just try to address that. Uh, the, the statement um, that 
we have. And I, I absolutely can understand this, saying that the 14th of February 2013 was the day our life changed forever, the day South Africa lost its hero, Oscar Pistorius, and the day Barry and I lost our precious daughter, Reva, at Oscar's hands. Now, almost 11 years later, the pain is still raw, it's real. My dear late husband Barry and I never been able to come to terms with Reva's death or the way she died. There can never be justice if your loved one is never coming back and no amount of time served will bring Reva back. We who remain behind are the ones serving a life sentence. With the release of Oscar Pistorius on parole, my only desire is that I will be allowed to live my last years in peace with my focus remaining on the Reva Rebecca Steenkamp Foundation to continue Reva's legacy. Uh, I think we can uh, go back to Tanya if we can. Talk us through, uh, for, for those of us who aren't familiar with the kind of the justice system in South Africa, how does this play out? What kind of conditions will Oscar Pistorius be being kept in? All right, so firstly, they participated in a victim offender dialogue where Barry met with Oscar. June didn't want to attend that meeting. When Oscar was eligible to be considered for parole, which was when he had served a certain portion of his sentence, a parole hearing convened, and that was in March this year. June attended that parole hearing where she opposed his parole, but Oscar himself didn't want to meet with June at the parole hearing, and he, in fact, was seen by the parole board afterwards. Mm. The parole board then did uh, make a decision that he wasn't eligible to be considered, which prompted Oscar to approach the Constitutional Court to to get directive from the Constitutional Court that he was, in fact, el eligible yeah. to and be considered. Then it was in placement. November of last uh, year. I'm so sorry, Tan, just because of your line, we've got some interference on it. We'll, ha we'll have to leave it for there. Leave it there for now. Tanya Cohen, thank you so much. Thank you. But the, the timeline was that it was November last year that then he was eligible for parole and therefore today, and it was just uh, an hour ago uh, that he was released from prison. We should be clear, he's not kind of a free man. He's under no. uh, lots of conditions. And, and you know, the, the really awkward side of this story, whenever there is something like this, there are safety concerns for Oscar Pistorius and people having to put in preparations to make sure that... He now isn't at risk now that he is out of prison, staying in his Indeed. uncle's home. And uh, as you say, there are conditions. He is banned from drinking alcohol. He is banned from talking to the press following his release. So, crucially, we won't hear from him directly because... Not, not because sort of no one's tried, tried to speak to him. He's not allowed to have any communication. Indeed. And he must also have therapy for anger and gender-based violence issues. And as we heard there, the statement from June Steenkamp, a very powerful emotive statement there, saying about the day her life changed forever. And June was talking about Reva's mother saying um, she was worried about other women and maybe what kind of risk Oscar Pistorius might pose. And so she had said that that kind of anger management at those courses, they were essential as part of the process of releasing Oscar um, Oscar Pistorius from prison. We'll keep you up to date on this story. Uh, there's lots more to come here today. Uh, the story that's dominated, really, sorry, of the week has been that of the junior doctor strikes. Indeed. And uh, we've seen kind of an upping of the ante from the government. Uh, the health minister saying very clearly, look, the NHS, speaking to doctors, belongs to all of us, not just you. And has said, striking doctors, I'm quoting here, cannot be allowed to switch the NHS off. If anyone's a bit confused, David, explain what the sort of process is when there's strike action in place. Uh, if hospitals get to a critical situation where they say, we need you to come off the picket line, there's a process in place for there that is. to happen. But in some cases, the BMA have said, no, we're not doing it. So, so I think what underpins all of this, that's called derogation. So essentially, they, they, hospitals can say to the doctors, look, we're in such dire straits, we need you to come off the picket lines. 20 derogations were made yesterday. All of those refused by the British Medical Association. We've also got uh, the, the joint deputy leader or the co-chair of the British Medical Association Junior Doctor Committee. This is Rob Lawrenson, who said the NHS hates junior doctors. Now, this is clearly ramping up into a huge political issue. Now, the junior doctors have actually been issued, uh, offered nearly 12%. They're holding out for 35% uplift. The nurses, of course, settle for 5%. Junior doctors in Scotland mm. settle for 12.5%. The consultants are going to settle uh, for something uh, less than that. Say that. The health minister has said, look, if you stop striking within 20 minutes, yeah. negotiations can restart. But the BMA are saying, no way. We've been asking what you think. And uh, Jim, good morning, who said... 
What is immoral and unfair is the government's approach to this. It is somehow OK to write off billions for inheritance tax cuts, but nothing for the hard work from doctors. Well, uh, Jim, the government will say we haven't said nothing. We've given you 8%, put a 3% three. on top of that, and that's not good enough. Uh, Amanda says, I fully support the junior doctors in their actions. The government should agree to full pay restoration, ensure that people don't die. Well, let me just tell you, Amanda, people are dying as a result of this strike action. And then you have to ask yourself, when people are actually struggling with the cost of living, when people haven't had pay rises, when they can't afford groceries, can you really justify us, the taxpayer, paying 35% uplift for junior doctors? And remember, junior doctors aren't just those initial doctors who qualify. They go right up to consultant level. So they're on between 30 and up to £65,000. But clearly, it's divided the nation. Keep your views coming in. You can text us, talk, and your message to 87222. In the meantime, there is lots more still to come on Talk Today. We're going to be discussing if prisons are fit for purpose after Zara Alina's murderer was reportedly caught engaging in sexual activity with a prison worker at HMP Belmarsh. This is Talk Today. We'll keep you up to date. Good morning. Thanks for joining us. You're with Talk TV on TV, on radio, online. We're on your smart speaker as well. Criminals using XL bully dogs as weapons to threaten others. No matter how well trained, most dog owners will tell you a dog can turn. Do you know what I love about Talk Today? We do it all. Sunak, Suella, scones. I rather like David Cameron. I don't sort of bear him any ill will because he delivered the referendum that he said he would deliver. The Tories love a scrap. You can almost see this coming round the tracks with Suella Bravman. She's heading up one side and Rishi soon at the other. The police are pro-Palestine. That is just not right. You swear an oath in the police to act without fear or favour. The Covid inquiry seems to have turned into a sort of pantomime. There's not really any substance to it. It's hard to know whether it's a farce or a tragedy. The amount of time it's taken, the number of illegal migrants currently sent by us to Rwanda, zilt. The amount of money it's cost, we're saying, what are we saying it's cost? About 140 million. 140 million pounds so far. So 140 million pounds so far result nil, absolutely nil. Are we only going to be trusting sources like Meta and Google? Where is our unbiased news going to come from? Calais in winter is cold. <laughs> <laughs> that is from the Jeremy Corbyn book. Kevin O'Sullivan is the worst presenter on Talk TV. Sitting on his fat ass, <laughs> talking for a living. If you're walking towards me and you're a vegan, you have a great big orange sticker over here saying, watch out, vegans about. The weirdest plank that we've had in, what, yeah. three years? Hundreds and hundreds of mice in a box, which he walks into a branch of McDonald's. McMouse Man. McMouse Man, yeah. McMouse Man. He should be easy enough to catch this guy, shouldn't he? I mean, he's got a house full of mice. He's on <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> This is a major summit. President Biden decided this is important after watching a Tom Cruise film. Sunak and the current Conservative government are not conservative. Why don't you leave that party and come to one that actually shares uh, your ideology? This has been a party political broadcast uh, on behalf no, of I the don't. Reform UK party. Hi, I'm Ofcom. Just, I'm just... Kids think all they have to do is take pictures of everything. Just shut down TikTok. Problem solved. This is really unfair. What's, what, what's unfair? If it's on camera, we're not doing the interview. Yes, I'm going to do. I'm I'm going to, you're going to resign? Yes, because I cannot continue my work. When I say I am God, I'm not joking. Did you feel Elvis was controlling? I've been answering your question, you answer mine. It's actually not my job to answer your questions. Just Are you prepared you. to call is Hamas a have, terror group? Is it possible to have a rational you can't, discussion can't, can you? I've asked you two questions. Should Hamas stay in power and are they a terror group? You're refusing to answer either of them. They that won't. is very telling. Talk TV, it's the only place where you get the truth. You've done a book on poetry. Poetry and music for the many. I love poetry, we can agree on that. On TV, on radio, and on your smartphone, this is Talk TV. This is Talk Today with David Ball and Rosie Wright. 
A very good morning. It is nine o'clock on Friday the 5th of January. Yes, you're with Talk Today on TV, radio, online and on your smart speaker. Your top stories this morning. Rishi Sunak signals the country will go to the polls in autumn, claiming he wants to keep going to deliver for the British people. But the opposition leader Keir Starmer accuses him of squatting in Downing Street as he vows to fight fire with fire in a general election. And an investigation is launched into Zara Alina's killer, who was caught allegedly engaging in sexual activity with a prison worker while serving his 33-year sentence. After another deluge, we're left with over 300 flood warnings across England. The outlook, thankfully, is for dry weather, but it will turn colder. <laughs> well, thank goodness for that. Drier and, well, and colder, though, so half and half. But uh, thank you very much indeed. Also, we're talking about pubs this morning. Dry January, some people doing dry January, others not. Very good, very impressive, very impressive indeed. But also uh, about the demise of the local pub. All your views and opinions, please keep them coming in. Talk today at Talk. TV. Right now, should we take a look at the headlines with Emily? Good morning. Oscar Pistorius, the former Paralympian runner, has been freed from jail 11 years after shooting dead his girlfriend, Reva Steenkamp. South African officials say he's at home under strict parole rules. And in a statement, Reva's mother, June Steenkamp, who opposed the athlete's release, said her only desire is to live her last years in peace and to continue her daughter's legacy. Hundreds of flood warnings are in place across England after Storm Henk brought more heavy rain overnight. A major incident has been declared in Nottinghamshire and experts are warning rain will continue to cause significant surface water with more showers forecast this morning. Andrew Goodman owns the Rose and Crown pub in Seven Stoke near Worcester. It's the third time this year it's been flooded. The water levels uh, just came in so quick this time within a couple of hours. Um, the water's travelled uh, from the River Seven, probably about three quarters of a mile from down the lane. Um, and within two hours, it, it's hit the front door. The health secretary says the NHS can't be switched on and off during strikes as junior doctors in England continue the longest industrial action in their history. We're heading into day three of a six day walkout. A U.S. court's unsealed a second batch of documents relating to the convicted paedophile Jeffrey Epstein. They contain more references to the Duke of York and claims that former U.S. President Bill Clinton threatened the magazine Vanity Fair not to publish articles about Epstein. And there's a new range of stamps marking the 30th anniversary of the Spice Girls. They feature performances over 15 years, from Jerry Halliwell's Union Jack mini dress in 97 to the closing ceremony of the London Olympics in 2012. You're up to date with the headlines. We'll have another update at 10 o'clock. Absolutely love that. The Spice Girls stamps. Going to go out and collect them, are you? Yes, girl power. <laughs> girl. I'm surrounded, actually, I have to say. Uh, thank you very much indeed, uh, Emily. Uh, Isabel, should we take a look at what's happening with the weather? Yeah, so weather-wise, it's getting better, which is great. You know, we want high pressure to build in, settling things down, because it has been so wet. We've had, what, eight named storms, a lot of rain for central and eastern parts of the country. Thankfully, things will start to dry up. It will take its time for the flooding story to abate because there's still quite a lot of flood warnings in force. But let's take a look. Times Radio sponsors Talk TV Weather. So even though it turns drier, there's still going to be some flooding because the water, the rainwater filtering through the river system. So it will take its time, but at least it's drying up. The rain across more central areas and the northeast tending to uh, peter out through the weekend. High pressure building in, bringing us some longer, drier spells. Just a few showers perhaps for the east. And there will be a chilly wind blowing, that easterly setting in through Sunday, Monday and Tuesday. A real chill in the air for southern parts of Britain, the north seeing more frost and fog. So this morning then, with that showery low gradually clearing away from East Anglia, this frontal system here pepping up a little bit with its rain across parts of northeast England and eastern Scotland this morning. Not particularly pleasant for the east there, but out to the west, the showers tended to fade through the day. And I think there should be some good sunny spells for Scotland this afternoon. Northern Ireland faring quite well as well. Still some showers coming in through the afternoon for Wales and the southwest, but a little bit of sunshine too. But then across, say, the peaks and up into the Pennines, northeast England, eastern Scotland, staying rather wet. And there'll be a lot of cloud for much of eastern England through this afternoon. A bit disappointing temperature-wise. As we head through this evening and tonight, 
there's still this streamer of rain just stretching down from Newcastle into the East Midlands and central southern England. Not a lot of rain on it, but a little bit. To the west, the showers tend to fade. And here with some lengthening clear spells, it'll turn a bit chilly with some frost, patchy frost, some fog as well. And then as we head through tomorrow, it looks pretty good. Some sunshine around for western areas through Saturday after that nippy start. Eastern areas still rather cloudy, but uh, the rain petering out and it will stay cold for a good few days. Times Radio sponsors Talk TV Weather. Thank you very much indeed, Isabel. Our top story today, Rishi Sunak has suggested an election will take place in the latter half of the year while speaking in Nottinghamshire. Well, the Labour leader, Sir Keir Starmer, was yesterday trying to use his major speech in Bristol to accuse Sunak of squatting in Downing Street for months on end. Joining us now is the deputy editor of The Spectator in the studio, Freddie Gray. Freddie, uh, a very good morning good to morning, you. Good morning, morning. Here we have both of them with a political agenda and Rishi Sunak sort of stole Keir Starmer's thunder, didn't he? A little bit, but I wouldn't say really. I mean, I noticed the papers today uh, were saying, you know, it's a gamble, Sunak's election gamble. I mean, he said his working assumption. <laughs> exactly. Uh, it was pretty vague. It's because uh, when you say working assumption, it makes the the assumption that you're not really in control. Well, again, and this is a mistake from Sunak because his whole image is, you know, he's a sensible man. Mm. He plans far ahead. He works tremendously hard. But this gives the impression that they're winging it, uh, which, of course, they are. Mm. And the reality, if you talk to, to um, senior Tories about this, is that uh, they're thinking about this election as, as putting down a, a, a dying dog. Uh, and it's just a question of when they actually do it. And I think you, you're right. They are winging it. And, and obviously, I have to be slightly careful. But when you look at other parties, there are other parties who are doing better than they have been doing, Reform UK being one of those. We've got the Wellingborough by-election coming up as well. Rishi Sunak obviously desperately concerned about whether he can turn around those fortunes. He has those five pledges, doesn't he? He's only delivered one of them. 20% uh, is his mark currently. Mm. Can he grow the economy? Can he reduce debt? Can he do all those things, stop the NHS waiting list from getting bigger? Can he do all of that by the election? My working assumption <laughs> is no, uh, he can't. I think the Tories need a miracle. They need a miraculous economic recovery. They need voters to feel richer, better off than they were five years ago. At the moment, there is no indication that's going to happen. Uh, it is possible that Keir Starmer... I mean, he, he was very boring yesterday. He's always boring. He's trying to be boring, and he's but very boring, good at it. boring, careful and cautious, that could be a strategy. Well, exactly, but you have Rishi Sunak doing the same thing, so there's mm. no contrast there. I do think tax is the issue that might define this election, and we're seeing a lot of that today. If the Tories... The Tories are beginning to believe in tax cuts again. That's a good thing for people who don't like tax. And we're going to see the but first one of that tomorrow when national insurance goes from 12 to 10%. Yes. I mean, the Labour Party will say, OK, great, but while our thresholds on income tax remain frozen, you're still taking more tax from us than you ever have done before. Well, Labour want to paint the Tories as now being reckless with tax. Mm. You know, uh, they're going to be the responsible ones. But the fact is, is that despite Liz Truss and the disaster of her premiership, Tax cuts are popular. People don't like paying tax. And so if the Tories can create what they call, you know, clear blue water between mm. Labour and them on tax, that gives them an opportunity. But I still don't think... So, it's so is that going to be the defining issue of the election? Because I think... I, I've thought about this a great deal. Tax cuts are really important. Front page of the eye, no tax cuts for two years under Labour. Immigration is right up there when it comes to the way people are going to vote. Not just illegal immigration, but legal migration to this country. Yes. And I think that is also going to be one of the dividing lines between those two major parties. Well, if you look at voter concerns, uh, you know, not just in this country, but most developed countries, immigration comes top almost invariably unless there's an economic crisis. So it's economy and immigration. And at the moment, immigration is where reform are stealing the Tories' thunder because the Tories have been talking about reforming, they've been talking about stopping the boats, but we've seen failure on every front and mm. we've seen massive influx of legal immigration as well as illegal. So that's where, why you're seeing the reform on about you know, 11, coming up to 12% possibly soon. With the Tories going down to 19%, that's where you might see the reform party hope that there could be splits within the Tory party mm. because you see people defecting to... 
uh, reform. It's, and and this makes the opportunity for Labour even, even greater. Yeah. The, the big question is, and lots of excitement maybe in some political circles and from journalists about you know, what Keir Starmer's going to say, yesterday we didn't learn that much about the concrete of the policies that they'd be putting into place. Yes, because all he wants to do is avoid banana skins. Mm. Mm. And so that's why this is going to be such a boring election. And that's why, if, you know, if Rishi Sunak kicks it into the second half of next year... When if it's, it's going to be boring, be... we've got a long wait. But, but we'll have Trump-Biden to keep us entertained that's in true. America. Well, well, we will, and that's interesting in terms of Farage and what he does and he was asked at that press conference earlier in the week what his plans were and he's kept them very much under wraps but it was word salad from Starmer you know he talked about Project Hope downtrodden UK national renewal he talks about holding on to flickering hope that things can get better this is this is very reminiscent of Tony Blair it doesn't actually mean anything yes I'd say the only almost exciting bit was when, <laughs> was when he said you know when they go low we'll fight fire with fire which was a sort of flick at Michelle's Obama, Michelle Obama's famous quote, you know, she said, when they, the opposition, go low, we go high. Yeah. Yes. Uh, but he said, we'll fight fire with fire. But there wasn't much fire in anything he said. Mm. Uh, he's a very boring man. And I do think <laughs> voters will, will quickly get fed up with him. But for now, boring seems better than chaos. But why do you think they'll get fed up with, with boring? I think for people who've looked through party gate, that I think chaos, as you say, is the right word, mm. they, they do just want a little bit of a period of calm they want i think they want solidity uh which both uh rishi and keir starmer are trying to offer um keir starmer's trying to promise that he'll, he'll be the man that takes politics out of your life because you're fed up about reading of brexit and immigration stop the votes up he'll try and make britain run properly but i'm not sure you can have solidity without a firm manifesto we'll see the mm. labor manifesto soon but I'm not sure they have clear ideas for getting the country out of the very mess. Don't, don't you think people want drive and passion and a vision for this country, particularly in a post-Brexit Britain? Yes. The whole idea is about how we make the UK a superpower once again. We don't want boring and bland. Well, that's, that's why Boris Johnson became Prime Minister. That's why he won an election. Uh, it's because he was able to inspire people. That We don't have many politicians in Britain who can do that. Uh, you know, Nigel Farage, for all his flaws is somebody who people warm to and they see that he's passionate. Uh, you don't get that from either Sunak or Starmer. So the perfect kind of recipe of ingredients for the <laughs> best politician right now would be someone who's calm with charisma. Yes. Do they exist? Where are they? Yes. <laughs> well, that's a problem. Should we talk about what's happened? Because in Scotland, it's been a big shift over the last year. The Labour Party there can look there and think, right, the SNP, whatever's happened there, it's an opportunity for Labour to soak up more seats in areas they didn't imagine before. That's going to be very hard for Rishi Sunak to try and combat. Scotland, Scotland is a key factor. Mm. Uh, and that, and combined with reform, taking all reform need to do is take in many seats, just 2 or 3% of mm. the Tories. Uh, and that would be enough to win that seat for Labour. I mean, so the reform the would also, but things. reform would also say it's about re winging, wing, winning back the red wall. Those Brexit supporters who are not enamoured with Keir Starmer are very worried about his Remainer credentials, mm. and they back Brexit and they want to see Brexit, a full fat Brexit. Yes, well, that, and again, they'll they'll drift towards reform. Uh, I think that you know, generally. Conservative-minded people don't like the Conservatives anymore. That's an impossible situation for the Tory party to get out of. They might like the words of the Health Secretary, front page of the Times this morning. Uh, she said, striking doctors, as this still goes on, doing the doctor striking in England, cannot be allowed to switch the NHS off. The government position with these strikes is, we will not budge. Maybe the public will think, yeah, she's got the right idea. Uh, I like what she's saying there. I think she's quite right to be going after the BMA, who are behaving pretty recklessly and badly in this situation. The problem, again, for the Tories, though, is by saying the NHS isn't just about the British Medical Association, which is right, she points towards the fact that the NHS, regardless of strikes, is failing uh, on almost every front. Uh, that is on the Tories. They've been in power for a long time now. Uh, the, the fact that they have not been able to reform the NHS makes a lot of voters think maybe you need Labour to fix the NHS. Mm. Uh, and that's going to be another deciding factor against the Tories. Freddie, thank you Bit so gloomy, much. Sorry. <laughs> no, it's OK. Yeah. It's the reality. Deputy Head of The Spectator, thank, thank you, you so much. much. Uh, there is lots more still to come here on Talk Today. We're going to ask if prisons are fit for purpose after Zara Alina's killer was reportedly caught engaging in sexual activity with a prison worker while serving his sentence in Belmarsh. This is Talk Today. A very good morning to you. We're here!
thanks for joining us. You're with Talk TV on TV, on radio, online. We're on your smart speaker as well. Criminals using XL bully dogs as weapons to threaten others. No matter how well trained, most dog owners will tell you a dog can turn. Do you know what I love about Talk Today? We do it all. Sunak, Suella, scones. I rather like David Cameron. I don't sort of bear him any ill will because he delivered the referendum that he said he would deliver. The Tories love a scrap. You can almost see this coming round the tracks with Suella Braverman. She's heading up one side and Rishi Sunak the other. The police are pro-Palestine. That is just not right. You swear an oath in the police to act without fear or favour. The Covid inquiry seems to have turned into a sort of pantomime. There's not really any substance to it. It's hard to know whether it's a farce or a tragedy. For the amount of time it's taken, the number of illegal migrants currently sent by us to Rwanda, zilt. The amount of money it's cost, we're saying, what are we saying it's cost? About 140 million. 140 million pounds so far. So 140 million pounds so far result nil, absolutely nil. Are we only going to be trusting sources like Meta and Google? Where is our unbiased news going to come from? Calais in winter is cold. <laughs> that is from the Jeremy Corbyn book. Kevin O'Sullivan is the worst presenter on talk TV. Sitting on his fat ass, <laughs> talking for a living. If you're walking towards me and you're a vegan, you have a great big orange sticker over here saying, watch out, vegans about. The weirdest plank that we've had in, what, yeah. three years? Hundreds and hundreds of mice in a box, which he walked into a branch of McDonald's. McMouse Man. McMouse Man, yeah. McMouse Man. He should be easy enough to catch this guy, shouldn't he? I mean, he's got a house full of mice. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> This is a major summit. President Biden decided this was important after watching a Tom Cruise film. Sunak and the current Conservative government are not conservative. Why don't you leave that party and come to one that actually shares uh, your ideology? This has been a party political broadcast uh, on behalf no, of I the don't. Reform UK party. Hi, I'm Ofcom. Just, just... Kids think all they have to do is take pictures of everything. Just shut down TikTok. Problem solved. This is really unfair. What's, what, what's unfair? If it's on camera, we're not doing the interview. Yes, I'm going to do. I'm you're, going going to, you're going to resign? Yes, because I cannot continue my work. When I say I am God, I'm not joking. Did you feel Elvis was controlling? I've been answering your question, you answer mine. It's actually not my job to answer your questions. Just Are you prepared you. to call is Hamas possible, a have, terror group? Is it possible to have a rational you can't, discussion can you? with you? I've asked you two questions. Should Hamas stay in power and are they a terror group? You're refusing to answer either of them. They that won't. is very telling. Talk TV. It's the only place where you get the truth. You've done a book on poetry. Poetry and music for the many. I love poetry. We can agree on that. Welcome back to Talk Today. The time is 9.17. The killer of 35-year-old Zara Alina Jordan McSweeney has allegedly engaged in sexual activity with a prison worker while serving his sentence in high-security jail, HMP Belmarsh. The prison says they have now launched an investigation into the incident. Well, to find out how something like this could happen in a place like Belmarsh, of all places, uh, we're joined by the former prison officer, Vanessa Frake, as well as Zoe Dronefield, a domestic abuse survivor and campaigner. Good morning to both of you. Uh, Vanessa, we'll, we'll start with you. Presumably, there are rules that would stop something like this happening. What has gone wrong here? Well, uh, there's a couple of things, first off. First off, it doesn't matter that it's Belmarsh. You know, it's a high-security estate is physical security and more staff, not necessarily that something like this couldn't happen. Um, the second thing is you have to remember that prisons are full of predatory prisoners, prisoners mm. who prey on women outside. So why wouldn't they prey on women inside? Um, and thirdly, I think we have to have a, have a really hard think about recruitment. Are we recruiting the right people? Are we training them well enough? And are we continuing that training throughout the year? And also, are we supporting them? And I think a mixture of all of that 
has led to more instances of illicit relationships with prisoners. And Vanessa, you and I have spoken about this before. You mentioned recruitment there, but also are we paying them enough? Are we getting the right people? You had training in coercive techniques about manipulation. As you rightly say, the people who are in prison are very good at what they do, manipulation, coercion, getting the better of people, and, and the staff themselves need to be protected and need to acknowledge that and know how to counter that. Absolutely. And, and you can only sort of do that by continual training. It's not a once-off thing that when you start the job, you get corruption prevention training. And also, you need to remember, what are these prisoners after? You know, it's not, it's not some sort of long-lost love affair. There'll be something in it for him, whether that's she brings a mobile phone in, whether she brings drugs in or, or whatever. You know, prisoners don't do things like this for no reason, for nothing for them. And, um, you know, it's important that you have procedures in place where staff who feel they're manipulated can go and can talk to um, staff in charge um, for, in order for these sort of things not to happen. But, um, you know, I think the prison service needs to have a long, hard look at um, its training techniques because predatory prisoners will be on the lookout. You can absolutely bet your bottom dollar for members of staff, not just females, but also male uh, staff who are vulnerable. And that may be their vulnerability from a number of things. They don't feel supported. They don't have the training. And perhaps they're not the right person for the job. Zoe's listening to that. Zoe, good morning. Thank you so much for your time. Mm -hmm. um, talk to us about those kind of manipulation techniques that people can use, particularly men, on maybe, we don't know what's happened in this case, but maybe more vulnerable women. Yeah, I mean, it, you know, I absolutely echo everything Vanessa just said there because, you know, I was looking through just last night at um, prison officer training and there's a real focus on, you know, training around the tools that they use, the radios and de-escalation of, of uh, violence. However, there doesn't seem to be any mention of any training around manipulation and coercion. And clearly the people that are in the prisons have, you know, there's there's going to be a high level of that just by the nature of the offending and, and, and certainly the category level in Balmarsh. Um, I, I also, yeah, I, again, echo what Vanessa said with regards to pay and the ongoing supervision. You know, how are prison officers allowed to be um, you, you know, left on their own with prisoners uh, in, a, in such a vulnerable situation, uh, particularly a male and a female and, uh, and potentially uh, vulnerable, um, a vulnerable female. And, you know, it's a form of grooming, you know. Um, yeah, it will start off small and build. And I assume your own experience has informed those opinions that you have. Yeah. Exactly. You know, I I uh, went through a it, uh, and it was grooming. You know, I was groomed by an ex partner, made to believe that he was the most wonderful man in the world. And actually, this was on the outside. And these are people that are in prison for, you know, hideous crimes. Mm. Vanessa, you know, we know that a woman was arrested on suspicion of misconduct in public office. Inquiries are ongoing. Where do you lay the blame of this? Because, you know, two people were involved in whatever this alleged incident was. And uh, clearly, may maybe it's not just about training. Um, you know, this prison officer absolutely failed in her duty if what is alleged took place. Well, first off, she wasn't a prison officer. She was a, a member of staff. So um, I think we need to correct that. But certainly, you know, it takes two to tango. Um, but I think both sides have to take the blame you know it's actually a criminal offense for a prisoner to manipulate coerce groom um, a member of staff um, but i think we do hear more um, in the media about the the woman involved but whichever way you look at it it's an abuse of power because she has the keys and mm. he doesn't mm. said that um you know he's a predator he preyed on 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 women outside why on earth wouldn't he prey on women inside? And I think that that has to be acknowledged by the prison service. And I think that they have to look seriously at their training and their ongoing training yes. with manipulation, because it's not just officers or prison staff. You know, manipulation can happen to us all. We all get um, complacent 
and uh, complacency breeds contempt. Indeed. And, and Zoe, what are your thoughts on that? Your, your experiences have made you write a book as well. Your, your final thoughts? Yeah, I mean, my book's called Mind Over Manipulators. And, you know, in there, I have a lot of tools around how you would spot the, the red flags of manipulation. And I always say, you know, it's not just my story. The book is a lot, there is a lot of information in there for professionals, for them to, because, you know, exactly what Vanessa said, it's not just, you know, prison officers. It happens across the board in all sectors, in all professions. There are manipulators everywhere. It's just understanding and rec recognising what that looks like. Vanessa, Zoe, thank you both so much for talking to us about that story. And we know uh, a prison service spokesperson said it'd be inappropriate to comment on a live police investigation. And the Met Police say uh, inquiries are ongoing. Yeah. Just as we've been talking, there's some breaking news uh, to give to you. Uh, a 16-year-old boy and a 17-year-old boy have been arrested on suspicion of murder over the death of 16-year-old Harry Pittman in North London on New Year's Eve. That's a statement from the Metropolitan Police mm. on talk today we will be keeping you up to date across this story the absolutely uh, tragic case you know murdered as people were watching and celebrating um new year's eve the arrest then of a 16 year old boy mm. and a 17 year old boy we'll keep you up to date we certainly will uh, let's finish on a lighter note about pubs closing across the country Please and just do. saying uh, and lots of you getting it in contact saying that actually it's really important to encourage people to meet to socialize and to drink alcohol free drinks instead and congratulations to you as well for your alcohol free january well, that's what I'll be doing this weekend. After you'll be here, <laughs> of be course, here. working yes, breakfast away. tomorrow and Sunday. But I'm, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm persevering with Dry January, and I'm convinced now you're holding me accountable. I'll do it. <laughs> I certainly am. Um, that is all from us here on Talk Today. I'll be back with Jeremy on Monday at six a.m. And Kev and Alex are up next. Have a great weekend. Thank you very much indeed for watching. Thanks for joining us. You're with Talk TV on TV, on radio, online. We're on your smart speaker as well. They have made a statement condemning Hamas. We expect to see the Crown revisit Harry's anti-Semitic Halloween costume. Criminals to use the XL bully dogs as weapons to threaten others. No matter how well trained, most dog owners will tell you a dog can turn. Do you know what I love about Talk Today? We do it all. Sunak, Suella, scones. I rather like David Cameron. I don't sort of bear him any ill will because he delivered the referendum that he said he would deliver. The Israelis are very conciliatory. All they want is to be recognised. The timing of this Hamas attack comes because there was the expectation there was going to be a deal done to normalising relations with Saudi Arabia. The Tories love a scrap. You can almost see this coming round the tracks with Suella Braverman. She's heading up one side and Rishi soon at the other. Reshuffles, usually very dull. This one has booster rockets attached to it. Certainly the tone has shifted in terms of what Rishi Sunak uh, has done. The question now is what he does next. The police are pro-Palestine. That is just not right. You swear an oath in the police to act without fear or favour. The COVID inquiry seems to have turned into a sort of pantomime. There's not really any substance to it. It's hard to know whether it's a farce or a tragedy. Talk TV has spoken exclusively to a member of the Blade Runners. Do you have a message for Sadiq Khan? We're not stopping until you stop. For the amount of time it's taken, the number of illegal migrants currently sent by us to Rwanda, zilch. The amount of money it's cost, we're saying, what are we saying it's cost? About 140 million. 140 million pounds so far. So 140 million pounds, so far result, nil, absolutely nil. Are we only going to be trusting sources like Meta and Google? Where is our unbiased news going to come from? Calais in winter is cold. <laughs> That is from the Jeremy Corbyn book. Kevin O'Sullivan is the worst presenter on Talk TV. Sitting on his fat ass, <laughs> talking for a living. If you're walking towards me and you're a vegan, you should have a great big orange sticker over here saying, watch out, vegans about. The weirdest plank that we've had in, what, yeah. three years? Hundreds and hundreds of mice in a box, which he walks into a branch of McDonald's. McMouse Man. McMouse Man, yeah. McMouse Man. He should be easy enough to catch this guy, shouldn't he? I mean, he's got a house full of mice. He's on <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> This is a major summit. President Biden decided this is important after watching a Tom Cruise film. Do you mm -hmm. think people underestimate how important music is for this country? It's about 10 times the size of the fishing industry. So the music industry, although it looks fun and glamorous, it's a tough, tough yeah. industry. Sunak 
and the current Conservative government are not Conservative. Why don't you leave that party and come to one that actually shares oh, no. your ideology? This has been a party political broadcast uh, on behalf no, of I the don't. Reform UK Party. Hi, I'm Ofcom. Just, just... Kids think all they have to do is take pictures of everything. Just shut down TikTok. Problem solved. Why did Nat West ever think she was worth her full payoff? Is anybody who's working for an institution funded by the taxpayer worth £11 million? Yeah. And I, know, I would what, say what the absolutely heck? not. This is really unfair. What's, what, what's unfair? If it's on camera, we're not doing the interview. Yes, I'm going to do. I'm you're, going to, you're going to resign? Yes, because I cannot continue my work. When I say I am God, 